pretty sure he said he was appointed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I want to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelco. I am the coordinator of the Global Health Initiative here at the center and also direct our environmental change and security program. And it's a terrific privilege on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Flip Strum, the Division of U.S. Studies Program Director, uh, for both of us to welcome you here. I wish Flip was um, here doing it in person. Unfortunately, she is uh, <laughs> perhaps apropos of our discussion today, but she's laid up with the flu and at home, hopefully watching on the webcast, <coughs> um, but was unable to join us. And it's really too bad because she spent so much time and really poured her heart into organizing this meeting as well as her colleagues and, and my colleagues. And so this is a collaborative effort of these two programs, but it's a shame that Flip can't, Flip can't join us today for our discussion of health status disparities in the United States, because I know she, as do I, believe it's a tremendously important <coughs> topic. And so we're thrilled that all of you have joined us, that we have a terrifically distinguished set of uh, speakers to share their insights with us, and we look forward to the active discussion for this morning's meeting. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you here. I wish we had uh, all our colleagues here, but it, it will be a, a terrific discussion nonetheless. Uh, allow me a word about the Wilson Center, the Global Health Initiative, and the Division of U.S. Um, uh, Studies uh, for a moment. Uh, the Global Health Initiative is actually one of the newest programs here at the center. We had a lot of activity on health going on at the center in the different programs and projects. We have a lot of regional programs and cross-cutting programs. But Lee Hamilton and the chairman of the board, Lee Hamilton being the president and director of the Wilson Center, uh, felt that it was important for us to have a, a kind of a, a, a locus for health issues because they are so um, um, so important, obviously. So we've been doing that now for a couple years, bringing together the different programs even within the center, uh, just like this is a collaboration with our U.S. Studies program, and uh, trying to facilitate dialogue between the worlds of policy and scholarship, something the Woodrow Wilson Center tries to do uh, on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy basis. It's, it's kind of mission with President Wilson having been our only president who had a PhD, and so Congress, when they set up the formal memorial, felt it was appropriate to have a living memorial where these worlds of practice and policy could come together with scholarship. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing. In the health area, uh, we've been focusing on four <coughs> broad topics. It gives us a lot of latitude and makes it more fun that way, but uh, health's impact on development, global and domestic health policies, infectious disease, and emerging health technologies. So, We've given ourselves a lot to work with, and there certainly are plenty of interesting and important topics there. Um, the Division of U.S. Uh, Studies was, is a much older program, been here at the Center for quite some time, uh, but it, it quite obviously is established to, to facilitate and stimulate um, analysis of what's going on in the United States. FLIP runs a very active program and um, has a very strong Congress project with uh, Don Wolfensberger associated with it. So we have um, a, a tremendous resource in these colleagues, and I hope you will, you will take advantage of their future programs as well. But today's uh, half-day conference on health status disparities in the United States, as I said, we have a rich set of panelists for discussion. Uh, we have a, a, a keynote address that Dr. Greg Block is going to kick us off with, and I'll say a, a, a word about that in a moment. But then just also to say we'll have two subsequent panels, one on the socioeconomics of health status disparities, uh, we'll have a short coffee break, and then we'll have a second panel on race, ethnicity, and health status disparities. And so I think we'll really be able to cover a lot of territory, and it's terrific that, um, that all of you have, have chosen to brave the weather, which somehow winter is coming back, uh, at least in the form of cold rain. So we appreciate you all coming in. As I mentioned, we are webcasting the event, so when it comes to the <coughs> Q&A time, I'll ask that um, you wait for one of my colleagues to come to you with a microphone so you can tell us who you are, but also so the folks on the online can hear your question. And when it comes time to after this meeting and you're going and telling all your friends what a great meeting they missed, you can actually tell them to come to the Wood Wilson Center webpage where today's meeting will be archived in the video so they can, um, so they can read a summary, get the PowerPoints, and, and, um, and actually be able to listen and share in the event. So as I mentioned, Dr. Greg Block is our, our keynote uh, kickoff discussion this morning. He's going to talk about the politics of health disparities. Uh, he's a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, as well as the co-director of the Georgetown Johns Hopkins Joint Degree Program in Law and Public Health. He's a former editor of the Yale Law Review and recipient of the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. He's written 
um, a number of pieces on issues that are, are directly and then indirectly tied to today's topic. And so somebody who's very accomplished on the scholarship side also, and it's, we're pleased always to see this at the Wilson Center where someone who's really contributing to the academic and the, the scholarship is also translating those insights into broader um, and more widely accessible forums, such as uh, op-eds in newspapers, something that he has done quite widely, participating in discussions on the Hill and briefing policy people at HHS and such. And so we, we've, we're firm believers that the, the scholars need to write the books and the referee journals, but they also need to take the time to, to make that make those insights more widely accessible to practitioners, policymakers, and the general public, something Dr. Blog has, uh, Block has done in, in spades. He also, I uh, just conclude in saying, has a JD and MD, which means he spent a lot of time in school. Um, I also want to, uh, as someone who took forever to get his degrees as well, I can appreciate that. Um, Gib Clark, on my right, is, um, is going to be our moderator for, for the morning. Gib is a colleague of mine, um, really instrumental in the Global Health Initiative, as well as the Environmental Change and Security Project. And so uh, I'm pleased that he'll be able to help guide us through the morning's discussion as well. Uh, but Dr. Block, I think we'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, uh, great to be here, although uh, I apologize for contributing to making the uh, Wilson Center, a, a cauldron of respiratory disease uh, this morning. Uh, I rest assured I'm getting over uh, this bronchitis thing, so I'm 98% sure I'm not infectious, but it's good that you're keeping your distance. Uh, and I guess, thanks to the webcast, there'll be archival footage of my respiratory symptoms should they progress in an uh, unpleasant uh, direction. Uh, we can go back and identify the uh, diagnostic mistakes made. Uh, well, it, it really is <coughs> uh, wonderful that the center is uh, taking on this uh, really important uh, and neglected set of issues. Um, I, I do think that this is uh, there's a fantastic uh, couple of uh, panels coming up from which the uh, the real learning in this conference uh, will uh, uh, will happen. Uh, I do want to say some things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I promised you that cough, and I'm going to deliver. Uh, I do want to say some things about the politics of uh, health disparity. We've begun our longest ever and surely our most expensive presidential campaign. And already health has moved to the fore as a campaign issue. The candidates have had lots to say about expanding coverage and controlling costs. And I confess to having a kind of Groundhog Day feeling about the political discussion so far. To those of us with uh, some gray hair, it's numbingly familiar, except that the numbers keep getting bigger and scarier. 47 million uninsured, and this number is rising by about a million a year. 16% of GDP, or $2 trillion, that's what we uh, Americans spend on medical care every year. And we have newer sets of scarier numbers to add to the discussion. Patients, we're told, only get about 55% of the care that they need and 50 to 100,000 Americans uh, a year die from medical injuries. So Americans should be forgiven for thinking that our health problems are pretty much all the result of medical care that's too expensive, too riddled with errors, and not available to those who can't pay. But as the distinguished speakers on this conference's two panels will tell you in much richer detail than I could, uh, medical care plays a surprisingly small role in determining our health. It's been estimated, roughly, that medical advances account for only about a fifth of the increase in longevity in industrialized countries over the past 100 years. What explains the rest? Well, public sanitation and pest abatement count for a lot. Clean water and sewage systems, the draining of swamps and the killing of mosquitoes and rats and other unpleasant creatures. Uh, on the other hand, the 20th century brought its own set of uh, new public health problems, sedentary lifestyles and chemical pollutants, smoking and overeating uh, and the like. So it's not clear how far the balance of public health solutions and problems has tipped in the past century. And it's not clear to what extent traditional public health policies, population-wide disease control measures and the like, account for our huge improvements in health are uh, huge improvements in population-wide health. What is clear, though, and what's astonishingly absent 
from our discussions of health policy in our political campaigns and our public discourse more generally is that our health status has much more to do with how we live, with the social and economic conditions uh, that shape our lives than with the medical care we receive or with what public health authorities do to control contagious disease. Even lifestyle factors like smoking and overeating pale by comparison to social and economic conditions when it comes to determining our health. And health status disparities among social and economic classes and between racial and ethnic groups have much more to do with the conditions under which we live our lives than with the medical care we receive. <coughs> this remarkable fact, this inconvenient truth, has potentially explosive political implications. That's because we Americans think about health in a very different way than we think about the material conditions of our lives or even the social hierarchies within which we live. Uh, though we argue a lot about the causes and remedies for social and economic inequality <coughs> and about the role of uh, race, the roles of race and ethnicity in this mix, we're by and large accepting of enormous differences in wealth and status. And many of us, perhaps not most of us anymore, are deeply disturbed by abject poverty. But even the hardcore Democrats among us seem to accept that some families of four with young kids ride in beaten up old Chevys and barely survive on Walmart wages, while others ride in Lexus SUVs with drop down TVs to private school soccer matches. We accept that some of us are CEOs, while others of us serve them coffee or clean their bathrooms or park their cars at the charity auctions. And that we don't admire the boss who abuses his health who yells at his secretary or won't, or won't let her take off a couple hours to meet with her kid's teacher at public school, we put up with it. Yet we feel much differently about health. Polls show that the vast majority of us think everyone should have access to pretty good medical care, even though we haven't gotten there as a society, uh, pretty good medical care on the public tab if he or she can't afford to pay for it. And the vast majority of us think that health is a matter of right or at least a matter of social obligation. <coughs> um, we think we owe each other, through our government, a serious effort to protect and to promote everyone's health with little regard for social and economic standing. But I haven't met anyone who thinks his government or her government owes him or her at least a new Buick or a Honda, if not a Beamer, with all the latest electronic options. And we tell ourselves various philosophic stories about this. For example, Rawlsian stories about the opportunities we would want from behind that veil of ignorance, or communitarian Michael Walserian stories about the common rights and goods that ought to be distributed to all in a society equitably as an expression of membership. In economics language, we think of health as a, a merit good or a merit want something that should be distributed equitably, not based on the existing distribution of wealth. We don't think of Buicks or Beamers or even protection from nasty bosses quite that way. Enter uh, from the left, uh, the far left, some of my friends at the American Enterprise Institute and the University of Chicago claim, the growing body of evidence that connects uh, our health closely to our wealth and to our sense of command and control over our lives and to the insulation that this wealth and control give us from life's daily corrosive stresses. <coughs> Did you come to this conference on a crowded metro train? And were you jostled by harried passengers as you uh, tried to get off? Or did you drive and worry uh, at most, like we did, about how to find the parking entrance and then how to find your way, our way, up, up here? Or did a limousine driver bring you stress-free to the closest uh, entrance? Do you have to race to your kid's school by 3 o'clock to pick her up? Or will your nanny drive one of your other cars to get her and then uh, be with her till you get home? The evidence is overwhelming that wealth and the social advantages that come with it beget health and that poverty begets illness. The evidence is overwhelming that health disparities between the most prosperous and the worst off in America and abroad are mainly the product of social and economic disparity rather than disparity in medical care provision. There's also a good deal of proof that there's a gradient relationship between wealth and health in between. The more prosperous we are, the healthier 
we are. Now, there's a lot more controversy over a claim that some make, that societies with lower degrees of economic inequality are healthier societies overall. The social, psychological, and biological mechanisms behind these relationships, both the proven ones and the more controversial <coughs> ones, uh, are only dimly understood. Diet, exercise, and other lifestyle uh, factors are thought to play a role, but the relationship between wealth and status and health remains strong even after these influences are factored out. Emerging biological theories supported by some <coughs> evidence include uh, the following, and this is a pretty incomplete list and the folks on the two panels will do a much better job than I could at uh, uh, laying uh, these out. Uh, relationships between the sense of control or lack thereof and biological mediators of stress response and, or, and, and mediators of physiological wear and tear, and these include serum cortisol levels and sympathetic nervous system activation. Also, relationships between anxiety and its biological mediators and the risk of myocardial infarction. And relationships between subjectively experienced stress, immune suppression, and our ability to fight off infections and to suppress the many microscopic occurrences of malignancy. And relationships between passive coping styles, the secretary can't snap out of his boss, increased arterial resistance, and development of high blood pressure, and relationships between social isolation, which is more common amongst poor people and members of disadvantaged minority groups, and uh, more intense subjective and biological responses to stress. This is morally and politically explosive stuff. That's because it pushes us to recast material inequalities, which we tend to accept, as health matters indeed as health matters that are much more important than medical care. It transforms tolerable inequality into a serious moral problem because we think about health so differently. <coughs> and for political leaders concerned about inequality in America, it presents an extraordinary leadership opportunity, an opportunity that none of our presidential candidates has yet exploited. The mounting social and biological evidence of a tight relationship between wealth and status and health is an unfolding biological Katrina <coughs> scenario, a stunning story of poverty's impact on human well-being. Some conservatives who worry about challenges to the prevailing distribution of privilege have indeed been stunned. Mark Hall, uh, who I consider a friend and is who's a leading uh, health law scholar and a critic of redistributionist policies in the health sphere, warns of looming Leninism if wealth-driven disparities in health <coughs> become grounds for public intervention to achieve greater equity. I doubt Leninism is a threat, and I'm disinclined to give health Trump value over Americans' traditional commitments to liberty and opportunity. <coughs> but I do, hope, excuse me, I do hope that bold leaders will step forward and use what we know about the relationships between privilege and well-being to push us further than we might <coughs> otherwise travel along the arc of justice. The prominent role of health in the looming presidential campaign uh, presents an extraordinary opportunity for a leader to do this. And we're lucky to have here today some of the most uh, important contributors to our understanding of the social determinants of health to give us some of the facts that define uh, the moral framework for action. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Block. Um, before we start our first panel, we're just going to have a, if there's a couple of quick questions or comments on his presentation, and then we're going to get into the first panel discussion. Uh, yes, please wait for the microphone. Yeah. Uh, George Kaplan. Um, I appreciate your comments uh, enormously. I, I, would, I would take issue with one thing, and it's the issue of we. Um, who is the we we're talking about when you say 
Uh, we uh, don't seem to be concerned about uh, a nasty boss, bad working conditions, et cetera. I think this is a case where, or <coughs> perhaps even inequality and opportunity. I think this is a case where it's important to have a, a framework which goes beyond our own borders. There are a number of countries uh, which have strong traditions of social justice, both in their internal affairs and foreign affairs. And I think um, perhaps we might consider um, part of the political framework also uh, trying to open up the eyes of uh, our citizens to the fact that in many regards, and I'll show some of them today, uh, we don't do quite as well as many other countries. Health is a good example, but so is uh, any, many measures of inequality of opportunity and uh, geography of opportunity. So, so the we, I think, is somewhat problematic. Um, I think the, uh, the, the we I have in mind is kind of some mythic aggregate of Americans. There's lots of folks, as I'm sure you know, who have written about uh, how big the pond is with yeah. respect to this culture of individual responsibility versus the uh, kind of the social lattice work, the uh, connectedness and the safety net uh, model. And of course, this, the safety net model varies even in, in Europe with Germans and Brits having, you know, maybe <laughs> less of an inclination that way than, uh, say, Swedes. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that we are fundamentally different culturally, uh, and that uh, culture has its day. And ultimately, even if I, I, like you, hope very much that we find a different balance than the current one, but I suspect that that different balance is still going to be uh, much more individual responsibility oriented uh, than the balance in many places in Europe. <coughs> if you could just pass the microphone down a couple of people there. I was wondering if, if you saw this indifference as uh, sort of typical of the moment, but not necessarily all of American history. And I was wondering if you look at the, the, the span of American <coughs> history, have there been administrations, have there been moments uh, when the society and especially the government have been more sensitive to the connection between health, disease, and lifestyle than the current administration or recent administrations? Uh, would you cite Roosevelt? Would you cite Johnson? I mean, what, how would you respond to that? I, was yeah, I, think, I, I think it's a, a great question. It'd be a really sorry, interesting. I'm Alan Kraut from American University. Uh, it's a, a great question. It'd be a really interesting thing for someone to go back on and try to you know, trace the history uh, on this. My intuition is that it would correlate with the bowling alone story. Uh, uh, that the, uh, and the missing piece in the bowling alone story, uh, the point that he almost makes at the end of that book, but doesn't quite want to make, because he doesn't, want, doesn't quite want to say war is good, uh, that, uh, the, uh, that, that war, uh, especially World War II, uh, played a huge role in giving people that sense of coming together. Uh, and played a huge role in shaping the culture of that World War II generation. And we think back ironically uh, to, uh, I get, gave a talk on this uh, a couple months ago at, the, at, at, at UVA, and I uh, wondered if people might throw things at me about this, but uh, uh, the beginning of universal health insurance coverage happens uh, not in this country, of course, but in uh, uh, Germany, Bismarck, in the wake of the Franco-Prussian mm -hmm. War. Infamous is one of the fast, one of the first uh, conflicts, along with our uh, civil war and the C Crimean War, involving huge proportions of citizens uh, 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 firing uh, walls of lead against each other uh, and falling as a result. Uh, and this notion emerges uh, that citizenry that is expected to sacrifice so much for the state uh, has unprecedented entitlements from uh, the state. And uh, there's a, almost a kind of brutal poetry of universal coverage that emerges from that. To what extent that extends to concern about determinants of health disparities, I don't know. There's a story, the, of course, the history of Rudolf Virchow, who was a, a German uh, uh, scientist very much concerned about the social determinants of health, maybe the most important pioneer in this area of doing his work at that, around that time. Uh, but my, my own sense of the history, which is incomplete, is that he didn't quite catch on in terms of uh, the uh, g getting political support. In, in 1880s Germany, it was easier to get support for health care than for social determinants of health status. 
Okay, yeah, in the back there? Hi, I'm uh, Chuck Croner from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, great, thank you. I, I think you really uh, uh, structured it beautifully and conveyed uh, with resoundingness the uh, permeation at all levels that there is disparity in health uh, in this nation. And <coughs> it is driven by those upstream factors of socioeconomic uh, inequalities. Um, as far as leadership, we, um, and Dr. Julie Gerberding, I think, have one of the most remarkable leaders we've ever had in public health. And at the most recent uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. ceremony, she stated, health is not divisible, in echoing Dr. King's sentiments. Um, the permeation of the disparity is really tremendous. And for those of you, and there are many more scholars that, than I, I can cover in this, but um, for example, things like allostatic load, which as you know are measures of internal well-being, of blood pressure and a variety of other measures and that chart the interior well-being of a person. We're at the micro level of disparity and I think the RAND Corporation recently came out to show that there are really imbalances <coughs> between uh, people who are in poverty. Poverty is so divisive in this country and highly correlated to that, of course, is African American health uh, followed by some of the other minorities. Um, endocrine disruption, things that we haven't examined in a real leadership way yet, but it's on the board, it's coming, and I'm very hopeful that uh, we, we will get leadership that emerges that says enough is enough, the evidence is overwhelming and preponderance, and we need to make some significant changes. Thank you for your comments. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm hiding in the back. Sorry. Craig Kennedy with Community <coughs> Health Centers. In your discussion, you, as in other discussions I've been part of, you kind of block all of healthcare access into one universal good. Is there a way to divide it into primary care versus specialty versus alternative versus other things to address disparities instead of just as saying, access to health care for folks, or is there a way to divide it that you see would be helpful in the current disparate landscape? I, th I think that's a, uh, an, an important point. Uh, and, uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, I, I, I should uh, not be critical of acute care at the moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should uh, want more. Uh, but uh, I, I think that uh, as we do more by way of comparative effectiveness analysis of a lot of the things that we're doing, we'll hopefully uh, gather better data about the kinds of preventative-oriented measures, prevention-oriented measures that really do achieve bang for the buck, and those that are matters of tradition, perhaps like certain aspects of the annual physical, uh, that have not, in fact, empirically been demonstrated uh, to uh, contribute all that much. Uh, there is now, I think, uh, an emerging bipartisan uh, consensus uh, <coughs> me, uh, on the Hill uh, about the need to really ramp up comparative efficacy research, and I sure hope that that will uh, involve research into these preventative measures as well. <coughs> it is, it, though, an interesting tension, uh, the tension between deploying resources uh, to acute care, to rescue-oriented care, hospital care, et cetera, uh, versus uh, taking these preventative measures. One could easily say, I'm tempted to say fastly, that we should make these allocations on the basis of the biggest bang for the buck. But that isn't quite who we are as people. There's a paradox here. Uh, we as people, are, it is part of our nature. Uh, 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 neuroscientists have traced this to the prefront, to parts of the prefrontal lobe. Uh, it is part of our nature to make a sympathetic connection with an individual out of proportion to a utilitarian calculus. Some of you might have seen recent coverage of research that, in fact, demonstrates that 
uh, people with lesions in the prefrontal lobe will engage in much more rational utilitarian uh, uh, calculus. Uh, uh, maybe that's what happens in the, I don't know, the MIT Department of Economics. I'm being mean to MIT, but uh, um, uh, maybe, uh, you know, th there, there's this no non-human aspect of the pure calculus. And so there's inevitably going to be a place for rescue-oriented care because of who we are. Out of proportion, to the calculus of costs and benefits, which in general should prefer prevention-oriented care. Okay, I think we'll take one more question and then we'll move on to our first panel discussion. Good morning, I'm Mary Lou de Leon Science. And I just, it's really a comment, not a question. Uh, going back to your historical uh, observations about uh, prevention and earlier intervention, and it brought to mind uh, the evolvement of professions, healthcare professions rising to the occasion historically. And one of those was the evolvement of public health nursing in New York City at the turn of the century in response to the health disparities uh, suffered by immigrants at that point in time. And it's time to resurrect that period again. Thank you. Okay, well thank you very much Dr. Block and thank you everyone for your questions and comments. Uh, I think that's been a great overview for what we're going to be looking at more specifically in the two panels. And um, so let's get started with the first uh, panelist, please. And thanks so much for your thanks participation. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody should drink out of this glass. No. on the bottom there. It says on. Okay, there we go. Okay, I can't, uh, I can't talk uh, sitting down, so hopefully this won't mess up the, uh, the, the webcast. Um, I'm, I'm really uh, thrilled to be... You know what? I'm sorry. Um, let me give you a brief introduction. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> With the uh, technical difficulties, I forgot myself here. Um, I should also introduce myself. My name is Gib Clark. I'm program associate here with the Global Health Initiative. And as Jeff said, I'd like to just echo his comments that along with the Division of the United States Studies, we're really excited about this program. Um, you have more complete bios on all of our presenters today, and that's good because it would take me, I think, all afternoon or all morning to read you through them. But I will give you um, a little background on the two presenters that are about to speak. Um, We've divided up today's session to look into two <coughs> large subsections of disparities. Obviously, when you look at disparities, there's a million things you can look at, and we had a hard time really narrowing it down. Um, but I think what we have represents a, a large section of the picture, and an interesting section of the picture that our presenters can discuss. Um, the first section looks at socioeconomics, um, and Dr. Kaplan's presentation will look at socioeconomics, um, contributions to disparities generally. Uh, Thomas Ricketts will then speak um, about geography and health status um, and how that contributes to this picture. Uh, George Kaplan is the Thomas Francis Collegiate Professor of Public Health in the School of Public Health and a research professor at the Institute for Social Research and director of the Center for Socioepidemiology and Population Health at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's also a docent at the University of Kupuo in Finland and was an associate in the Population Health Program of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. He is the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholars Program at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Kaplan, please. 
Well, I'm uh, thrilled to be here today. We change hands here. I'm thrilled to be here because I think the, uh, the task of translating what we know about socioeconomic inequalities and other inequalities in health into policy is the number one task at this point. For 25 years, I've been doing research on the topic. I'm thrilled about all the uh, uh, drilling down as we go more and more uh, underneath the skin, understanding it, but I really feel that uh, we know enough at this point to move uh, to putting uh, inequalities in health on the political table, and that that agenda is not going to be appreciably uh, increased by further knowledge about the mechanisms, the biological mechanisms, as interesting as they are, and they are really interesting. So today I want to talk about uh, socioeconomic inequalities in health. There are many kinds of inequalities in health. Um, we see differences by uh, socioeconomic measures, um, by, by race and ethnicity, by geography, by gender, by uh, geography, and by, by sexual orientation, by many different dimensions. But I want to focus on socioeconomic inequalities because I think they are core. They're core not in the sense that they're fundamental, but core in the sense that we can do something about them. We know a great deal about uh, policy levers that can change uh, both the level and distribution of income in the society. We do it all the time in recent years, perhaps in the wrong direction, but we know how to do it. Now, let me think how this works here. Okay. In, in thinking about inequality and socioeconomic inequalities in health, I want to use this uh, wonderful term that was uh, coined by Martin Luther King Jr. He talks about the corrosive character of inequality. And in his Nobel Prize address in 1964, I think it's worth reading, and he's talking about poverty here. Poverty projects its nagging prehensile tentacles in lands and villages all over the world. The problem of poverty is not only seen in the class division between the highly developed industrial nations and the so-called underdeveloped nations. It is seen in the great economic gaps within the rich nations themselves. <clears throat> it is obvious that if man is to redeem his spiritual and moral lag, he must go all out to bridge the social and economic gulf between the haves and the have-nots of the world. Poverty is one of the most urgent items on the agenda of modern life. In the final analysis, the rich must not ignore the poor because both rich and poor, and here's this wonderful language that he was so good at, are tied together in a single <coughs> garment of destiny. All life is interrelated and all men are interdependent. The agony of the, of the poor diminishes the rich and the salvation of the poor enlarges the rich. Now, when we think about the relationship between economic status and health, uh, this slide shows what we're comfortable in thinking about. So on the top, we have a global, um, we have a map of the world, and on the top we have colored the map according to the percent of people living uh, under less than one dollar per, di per day. And on the bottom, we've colored it in terms of life expectancy and birth. And we see, of course, that the poorest countries have the lowest life expectancy. Now that's not a given, it doesn't have to be that way, but it is acknowledged by most people that it's true. What's less acknowledged is the enormous literature on socioeconomic factors and health in um, mid and high income countries. And this, uh, this figure uh, just shows the results of a uh, Medline search where we looked at the descriptors of uh, social class, socioeconomic factors, income or poverty, not education, because I didn't know how to sort out health education from that. Uh, the number of publications per month on the topic. So these all have to do with health. Uh, it's extraordinary. In the period 2004 to six, there were nearly 600 publications a month, which in one way or another dealt with the relationship between socioeconomic factors and health. It's gotten to the point that those of us um, who, are, who study this can't, can't keep up. And you see there's been this explosive increase since the 1980s. 
and it hasn't abated in the 1990s or early, two th or early part of this uh, century. So there's this extraordinary literature, and what it does is to lay out certain facts. The facts are that socioeconomic position and health, uh, that the relationship between socioeconomic position and health, as socioeconomic position increases, health gets better, whether we measure it by income, occupation, education, wealth, etc. That this is a widespread relationship, that we see it across periods of time, across places in the world, and across groups. It may vary in magnitude, it may be larger or smaller in one place or another, or at one time or another, or in one group or another. But it's invariably, almost always, in the same direction. It's a relationship, and I'll give you some examples of this. It's a relationship that affects all age groups, both the young and the old, and those in between. It affects multiple organ systems and multiple disease outcomes. It's not fixed in time, and that perhaps is the, the most optimistic part of my talk, because it is, not, it is not given in our DNA that there must be inequalities in health. Okay? It's not given by our biology. It is a social fact. And most risk factors uh, for the common diseases and many uncommon diseases are more common among the poor than among the wealthy. Now let me give you some examples. Now that, for some reason, is not showing correctly, but we'll live with it. Um, okay, this, this data, this slide, shows uh, the relationship between family income and risk of death in about 700,000 people taken from the current population survey run by the Bureau of the Census, who are then uh, followed up, uh, matched to the National Death Index, which is a repository of death certificates. And I don't know why it's not showing right, but the, uh, the pink line, the pink line just shows the income distribution, which is highly skewed, and I suppose Bill Gates is out. Uh, I don't know if that's L or, you know, which direction that is, but, but way out. Has a very long tail. The blue line, shows the risk of death over roughly five to 10 years um, of a person at a given income level compared to a person at the mean income, which in, in mean household income level, which in the, the late 80s was around $40,000 a year. What you see, there are two things you see here. Uh, one is that as income goes up, the risk of death uh, decreases relative to that person uh, at the mean income. So this is the gradient that people talk about. But you notice that there's another aspect of this, which is that it's very steep here and very shallow here. The bulk of the relationship uh, in the U.S. between income and mortality, the bulk of the deaths, 50% of the deaths, occur in the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of the population. And the break in this curve is at family incomes of around 20,000, around, uh, around what the working poor make. <coughs> So we see this strong relationship, two to three-fold higher risk of death at lower incomes compared to the average income. Now, socioeconomic position is related to many diseases and causes of death. Um, diseases, whether we consider the incidence of disease, the first occurrence, or mortality from that disease. And this is just a, a convenient sample that if one could fill the room with with examples. So we see the relationship if we look at low birth weight and prematurity, childhood injuries, diabetes, asthma, depression, oral health, heart disease, most cancers, not all of them, but most, stroke, vision and hearing impairment, dementia, and a whole other cast of things that we don't want to have to uh, experience. These diseases occur across multiple organ systems and across stages of the life. So this is the broad, generic nature of the relationship between socioeconomic position and health. Now, it's not fixed in time, and this is a very, this slide shows some trends in life expectancy. This is work by Gopal Singh at uh, NCI. Um, and what he's done is to not look at individual uh, socioeconomic status, but life expectancy by, of counties. And he divides the counties into um, into uh, uh, 20, 20 ranges, and he shows um, at each year, like 80, 82 here, that the uh, life expectancy in the poorest county is 2.8 years less, I'm sorry, less 
than the life expectancy in the wealthiest counties. That's in 80 to 82. In 90, 1998 to 2000, it had almost doubled to 4.5 years. So what we see is that the gap between the rich and the poor, or in this case, the rich and poor, those people living in rich and poor counties, has actually increased at a time when there's been uh, increases in prosperity, at least in some parts of the income distribution. We also find that mo many behavioral, social, and environmental risk factors are patter patterned by socioeconomic position. So smoking, physical inactivity, obesity, excessive alcohol use, uh, illegal drug use, and legal dr drug use like smoking, other risky behaviors, social isolation, lack of access to health care, poor indoor and outdoor air quality, dangerous work in residential settings, again, the list could fill the room, are all seem to be patterned in an orderly way. Uh, they're worse if your economic status is worse. Now, increasingly, as we sort through these 600 publications per month, a view, a perspective on, um, on uh, determinants of population health and health inequalities has uh, developed. And I just want to uh, show that to you briefly in this slide. Um, so here we have individual and population health. We have the pathophysiological pathways, which the factors under the skin that relate socioeconomic position to health. We have the, the um, genetic and constitutional factors, individual risk, uh, risk factors like smoking and alcohol consumption, physical activity. We have social relationships. We have living conditions, housing, institutions such as medical care and others social and economic policies. And the, the, the view that's developed, and there are many cartoons that make the same point, the view that's developed is that if we really want to understand uh, health and health inequalities, we really need to have a perspective which integrates all of these and does so in, in the uh, context of the physical environment and the life course. So where does this take us to in terms of thinking about reducing uh, health inequalities? And to do that, I want to move from facts and figures to a little story. The story is about Myra. Uh, I call her an American and elsewhere uh, tragedy. Uh, now this, this is unfortunately, it's not supposed to animate one word at a time. There's, this is a different version of PowerPoint apparently. Um, well, this will be a little slower. <laughs> Myra is now 12 years old. Her parents have been, have been unemployed on and off for most of her life, including the entire year before she was born. They move from apartment to apartment as one health or job crisis follows another and are evicted because they are unable to pay the rent on time. Often they reach the end of the month with little money to spend on food or other necessities. An occasional treat following a payday for one of her parents is a fast food hamburger fries and a 32 ounce soft drink. They live in a neighborhood bereft of parks but with a surplus of abandoned buildings and crime. School is a refuge for Myra, it's safe and she has friends there but her teachers are burdened by too many students, too few books, too little pay, and too little training. There is no recess, physical or health education, school nurse or counselor, or computer training. Some days, me, I'll slow down a minute so I can. <laughs> this is why I like to do it on my own computer. Uh, some days she doesn't feel like getting out of bed and going to school, so she just stays home and watches television. Her mother has a minimum wage cleaning job in a mall an hour's ride away by bus. With a work schedule that changes unpredictably from day to day, she's employed on an hourly basis by a subcontractor to the mall and receives no health, retirement, or other benefits. Her father is a non-union carpenter but works only intermittently because, uh, due to the poor economy and because he had been previously injured in a fall from unsafe, uninspected scaffolding. Because of the fall and lack of proper medical treatment, he has lost some mobility. Needlessly to say, her parents do not have any health insurance and have to rely on public clinics and emergency rooms for care. So Myra's up life up to age 12, and she is the individual within these broad patterns of health inequalities, is characterized by parental unemployment and poverty, by vulnerable occupational st status for her parents, by residential instability and poor housing, by inadequate schooling, by insufficient food insufficiency and binging on fast and junk food, 
by under-endowed and dangerous neighborhoods, and by poor access to poor, and to poor quality health care. Myra's health, if we think about it current, she's at increased risk for obesity, poor oral health, asthma, increased susceptibility to communicable diseases, injuries, depression, type 2 diabetes, this is all based on evidence, early sexual activity and associated risks, early illegal and legal substance use, and other behavioral and social risks, gang membership, aggression, victimization, social isolation, etc. What about her future? Well, again, based on evidence, she's at increased risk for early, uh, pre uh, early pregnancy and prematurity, hypertension, obesity, cardiovascular disease, complications of diabetes, uh, lung disease, musculoskeletal disorders and mobility limitations, depression abuse, and behavioral and social uh, uh, risks and legal involvement, victimization, adverse occupational trajectories, etc. So what are we going to do for Myra? What can be done to close the gap between Myra's health and those better off socioeconomically? And I want to now focus on upstream policies. I want to focus on social and economic policies that we believe can have an impact on Myra and those like her. And these would be upstream policies to reduce child poverty and increase opportunity, uh, to increase education and training, to in investments, to invest in creating healthy communities, to reduce marginalization by race, ethnicity, and nativity, to increase access to quality health care, and in general, to end what I call compound disinterest, which I will define in a moment. So how do we reduce uh, child poverty? Now remember, there's no such thing as child poverty. Children are not the wage earners. We're really talking about adult poverty. So there's been this wonderful framing that's happened over the last 40 or 60 years where we've taken adult poverty and called it child poverty to engage uh, pro-child activities while we were actually seeing adult poverty decrease and child po uh, uh, elderly poverty decrease and child poverty increase. Um, so, so child poverty is really adult poverty. And what do we know? about adult poverty. Well, what we know is that income inequality has been increasing. So this slide shows mean annual earnings by quintile for men and women, uh, working age men and women, 25 to 64, at two points in time, 1973 and 2003. It would be a little bit worse now. What you see on the left side is the results for men, and you can see that the bulk of the uh, increase in earnings has occurred in the top, in the highest quintile, where there's been substantial increases. And for men, uh, in the middle and uh, lowest uh, uh, quintiles, mean earnings have actually gone down. Okay? For women, there's again been this big increase in the top quintile and small increases in the lower and middle quintile. So one of the things we can do is to think about where do these, how are these mean uh, earnings generate, mean annual earnings generated? Well, um, but first, um, let me just show that we don't do so well in adult poverty uh, translated into child poverty. So this slide just should make, show some international comparisons of child poverty rates from the Luxembourg Income Study, probably the best study, uh, best, best set of comparative data for comparing countries in terms of economic uh, uh, indicators. And this shows that of these uh, 10 or 12 or 15 countries, the U.S. has by far the highest rate of child poverty. So we have 20.3%. Uh, this is different from the uh, federal figures because it's calculated somewhat differently. But it's calculated the same across all these countries, 20% in the U.S. and 7% in the Netherlands, uh, under 10% in Germany, et cetera. So we don't do so well. Now, one of the reasons we don't do so well is because we have so many low-paid <coughs> workers. This shows a series of countries, and on the left axis, uh, it shows the child poverty rate, and on the uh, bottom axis, it shows the percent of full-time workers with wages that are less than two-thirds of the median uh, wage. So it's the percent of low-income workers. And you see there's a, a very, very strong relationship, as you might expect. The more low-wage workers you have, the higher the child poverty rates. So if we want to increase child poverty, if decrease child poverty, if we want to decrease the illness connected with child poverty, we have to do something about wages. 
Uh, and you can see the U.S. <coughs> is uh, an outlier uh, with the highest rates of uh, low-income worker, low-wage workers among all these uh, countries. Now, the other way you can um, decrease child poverty is through taxes and transfer programs. And this, again, shows comparatively across countries the extent to which taxes and transfers reduce um, uh, child poverty from the levels you would have if you had, if they were just based on um, uh, pre-tax and transfer incomes, basically on wages. Uh, and you can see there are enormous variations, but the thing that's outstanding to me is how little, how little uh, we reduce, if you look at these bars, the two, the, two uh, the one grouping from the right, we see these high levels of child poverty just um, below Mexico, but higher than all the other countries. Uh, there are countries which are quite high in terms of child poverty, but they reduce them substantially with tax and transfer programs. So things like the earned income tax credit, for example, do help somewhat in the U.S., but they don't come close to decreasing uh, poverty rates as much as, uh, as they are reduced in many other countries by tax and transfer programs. Now let me move on. Um, and in fact, child poverty creates adult poverty, and it does it intergenerationally. And this is kind of a complex uh, slide, but what it tries to show is the relationship between parental father's income <coughs> and son's income in the U.S. And uh, I'll summarize it here. Um, the peaks, these two peaks here, are those, quote, caught in poverty and affluence. 31% of sons in the lowest decile as children will end up as adults in the lowest decile. 50% in the lowest decile as children will end up in the lowest 20%, and 1.2%, the lucky, will end up in the top 10%. Now, on the other side, 23% starting in the top decile will end up in the top decile, 41% in the top 20%, and 2.4% will fall down to the lowest decile. So downward mobility from the top quartile to the bottom quartile is five times greater for blacks versus whites. So we still have an enormous amount of, um, the class system is alive and well in the US in terms of income. And it, downward mobility for, for African Americans who are able to, to, to have high incomes, their children have a high, have five times the rate of decline into low incomes as do whites. And this doesn't measure wealth. And we know there are far greater differentials by wealth than there are in terms of income. And wealth is what gets passed on intergenerationally. Wealth is what allows parents to pay for their grand grandparents to pay for their grandchildren's college, uh, for their children to buy houses, et cetera. So what about education and training? In 2001, only an estimated 68% of all students who enter ninth grade in the U.S will graduate with a regular diploma in 12th grade. And the rates vary enormously, as it shows on this slide, by race and ethnicity. So it's 75% for white students, 50% for black students, 51% for Native American students, and half, 53% uh, for Hispanic students. So we're not doing a very good job of keeping kids in school. What about, oops. Back. Well, for some reason, this slide isn't showing. Um, I don't know why. Um, what it shows is that about 15%, 15 to 20% of kids report um, being uh, threatened or victimized with a weapon in the last year in high school, in, in a 12-month period. <coughs> so we're not taking very good care of them in terms of their safety. They're not doing very well in performance, at least comparatively to other countries. This shows combined mathematics and literacy scores uh, by country for 15-year-olds measured in a comparable way across many countries. And um, the US is sixth from the bottom in all these countries. And you see the rates vary enormously. The funding of education is central to this. State governments provide greater than 90% of funds for K-12 education. 53% comes from property taxes with huge 
rates, so it's more like 84% New Mexico and 38% in, New, in uh, Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska, right? Any Nebraska? Yeah. Um, local funds provide from 90% to 20% of all funding. So we've funded education out of local and state resources. So as the, tr as the tides move up and down locally and geographically, so does the funding of education. And there are significant disparities in funding per student. Uh, by poverty status, about $1,400 a year. Uh, by minority status, about $1,000 a year. And these differences add up. So for example, in New York, um, for a high school of 1,500 people, uh, these disparities end up to a, end up uh, to a difference of about $3 million a year in funding of a single high school. Now what about investing in healthy communities? Well, we used to have this notion of the green belts and uh, there were village centers, you know, that were surrounded by farms and wetlands and industry was somewhere over here. Uh, well, we know now that the realities are somewhere between between this and this, okay? Uh, often accompanied by huge uh, costs of transportation. And this is actually not, this is Houston, this is your parking lots um, on the bottom left corner. So um, w does it matter for health? Well, um, many, many years ago, we looked at the, um, over 20 years ago, we looked at the health experience of people who lived in a poor area in Oakland, California. And we compared them to people living in other parts of Oakland, California. And we found that um, those who lived in the poverty area uh, d died at a 50% higher rate, okay? And this was after we took into account every property of their racial, socioeconomic, and behavioral uh, factors we could measure, everything we could measure, okay? And there now are literally a 1,000 studies that, that show that neighborhood characteristics uh, have an important impact on, on health. Um, now what do we know about neighborhood characteristics? This slide, which comes from the work of Myron Orfield, um, shows the Cleveland uh, metropolitan statistical area. And what, they, what they've done is um, map the tax, here's Cleveland, and then it's surrounding it all the uh, suburban uh, areas. Map the tax capacity per household by municipal area. There's huge variation. So the, the range is from $122 in tax capacity per household to $28,000. Now, if you fund schools, garbage collection, public health, based on local taxes, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have enormous disparities. So the geography of opportunity is heavily affected by the way we fund local services. And that's what causes, we think, a lot of the neighborhood differences in health. Now, we have to remember now that this geography opportunity has changed. And so now, according to a recent uh, report from, um, from Ur I think from, from Brookings, um, suburban poor now, uh, now outnumber poor in the cities. As we have gentrified the inner cities, we have pushed poor people out to the <coughs> first ring of suburbs. Uh, you see that in this area, you see that in many areas. Now, I'm not gonna talk about these factors because other speakers will, will talk about them. But there's no question that the marginalization, both the institutional and interpersonal mar marginalization that happens in our society based on race, ethnicity, and nativity is an extraordinary generator of health disparities, as, is the, as are the differential uh, patterns of access to healthcare and, and uh, state-of-the-art healthcare. Now, let me just, end with this notion of compound disinterest. The first thing is we know, as John Milton said, that the childhood shows the man as the morning shows the, sky, as morning shows the day, okay? So we have uh, adult, uh, adults, adult health creating differential patterns of disparities in birth outcomes, creating differential patterns in child health, which create different differential patterns in adult health. We can have a vicious cycle or a virtuous cycle here. What we're more used to is the vicious cycle of compound disinterest, of one disadvantage adding to another over the lifespan. There are now a number of, um, there are now hundreds of studies 
which show that uh, factors that occur early in life, as shown in this slide, can affect health in, in later life, uh, either by um, um, uh, factors that, that are not observable but are basically built into the biology, or we can have these chaining of risks and disadvantage which build up, or we can have this accumulation of disadvantage over the life course. The end result of all these is what I call compound disinterest. So Myra's life and others like her represents this compound disinterest. Time after time, system after system, there's a failure to sustain and nourish the capacity for health and development. It is not difficult to envision how the fragility of her parents' situation in an unstable economy to stripped away many social protections, neighborhoods bereft of resources and oversupplied with problems, an overburdened and under-resourced educational system and a failed social public health and social insurance system could put Myra's health um, and development at risk. Nor is it hard to imagine that these forces played out over a life course could act synergistically, <coughs> compounding, as in compound interest, the threats to Myra's development and health over her life course and even acting on subsequent generations. Myra, her parents, and perhaps her future children are but a thread in the unraveling quilt created by compound disinterest and consequent health disparities. With little imagination, one can visualize a society filled with Myra's and Max's where there is a compounding of disinterest that blankets current and future generations, where a vision of healthy and productive lives for all is blocked by exponentially expanding disadvantage and blocked capability, where the gap between what is possible and what is realized grows larger and larger. If we mind this gap, if we pay attention to it and try to use social and economic policy levers to affect it, um, we may just improve health and reduce disparities in health. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kaplan, for an excellent presentation. We're going to move uh, right along to uh, Thomas Ricketts. Uh, Thomas Ricketts is the Professor of Health Policy and Administration and Social Medicine and also the Director of the Health Policy Analysis Unit at the Cecil G. Shep Center for Health Services Research at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He, is, uh, he was the Founding Director of the North Carolina Rural Health Research and Policy Analysis Center. Uh, the focus of his research has been on policy making for the health care workforce and access to care for rural and underserved populations. And Dr. Uh, Ricketts, who was formerly the editor of the Journal of Rural Health, is now the editor of the North Carolina Medical Journal. Uh, he's going to be taking a look at uh, disparity in geography. Um, floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the Wilson Center for the invitation to uh, join you and to be with uh, uh, other distinguished speakers. Um, I uh, first have to um, uh, explain a little bit about uh, who I am and, and what I plan to do. I am not an epidemiologist. I'm not a clinician. Uh, I'm uh, not even a geographer, and I'll present a lot about geography. I'm an amateur geographer. Um, I'm a fellow of the Royal College of Geography, which, if you know anything about it, is like the, being a member of the National Geographic Society. But I tell <laughs> people that, and it seems a little more impressive. But, um, but if you have uh, 60 pounds, you can join too. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be, uh, the, the presentation will be a little on the derivative side. I will make use of uh, other folks' work and uh, some of our original work. Uh, but it's going to be largely speculative, um, a lot of visual effects here, and uh, ask you to uh, really uh, think about what I'm presenting in an in a integrative way uh, to help maybe help your work um, and perhaps to guide some future research. Perhaps it, if this would develop some questions on your part, it would, I'd, I'd appreciate hearing them. Um, I, I'm also going to be a little uh, provocative, I hope, and argumentative. Um, there, I, I know there are um, interests uh, in the room um, who will perhaps be offended by some things I say, uh, or I hope that you'll be stimulated by them uh, otherwise. Um, but um, I, 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 at least I hope that, if, if, if nothing else, I'll show you some uh, colorful and pretty maps. Uh, if, I, if I don't uh, illuminate you, I'll at least um, uh, provide you with some. Um, this I think we're doing our 
not our autumn uh, tones in our map colors, but our spring tones. It is uh, April, so. Um, what do we mean by geography in the context of health disparity? Folks generally invite me to talk about urban-rural differences, uh, expecting uh, something about uh, the problems of rural populations, and I will present information on that, but it's not necessarily the focus of what I uh, want to do or intend to do. Um, there are, uh, there is in policy as well as reality in the United States a, uh, an urban-rural differential, um, but the rural differential is largely focused on really systems of care, not necessarily rural populations. Uh, the United States does not have a rural policy. Uh, we might have an agricultural trading policy or an economic policy for agriculture, but we do not have a policy that focuses on rural populations and rural places, and that's one of the problems that we would have, especially since rural populations and places do have some uh, problems with health disparity. Um, we have uh, in the United States a structure, a population structure that identifies urbanized people and urbanized places. The Census Bureau identifies urban places. It doesn't recognize rural places. It rec recognizes metropolitan places um, for the purpose of counting, especially <coughs> for economic purposes. And it now recognizes what are called micropolitan places. Uh, these are not quite urban. They are the small towns, 20,000, 30,000 or so, uh, which tend to be uh, rural centers, uh, that is, uh, larger towns in the midst of, uh, say, uh, surrounding rural or agricultural or frontier areas. Rural is something of a residual classification, uh, which has, uh, which when the um, uh, HICFA and the Centers for, uh, well, CMS later, uh, began to discriminate against them in terms of hospital payments. We had a, uh, a fluorescence of the uh, rural policy, rural health policy groups uh, focused on uh, payment policy. Uh, I'm not going to focus on payment policy. I'm going to focus on uh, geographic differentials that might affect uh, rural health. But there are other geographies. Um, I'm going to emphasize regions of the United States. Uh, regions are very important in disparity in the United States. Uh, I think I'll illustrate that. Another <laughs> geographic concept is distance to care, um, and that's something else that would probably, that distance to care would be something people would uh, assume that I would focus on because distance to care generally means less access, and, and there are uh, good studies that say that uh, distance to care has an effect on your ability to receive good care and an impact on mortality, but I'm not gonna talk about that very much. I will mention uh, neighborhoods. Professor Kaplan has talked a little bit about that in uh, showing the picture in Cleveland, but again, I won't emphasize that. But the, there are many different dimensions to geography that can be affect uh, uh, health care, health status. And uh, let's just turn a little to uh, uh, rurality. There is a perception that as you move from uh, the center of a city on out, that things become more uh, rural. Um, and that as you move along, say, from large cities, you go through the suburbs, you then into, you encounter some towns and villages, uh, country, wilderness, and then frontier. All of these are uh, recognizable classifications, but that's not how things are structured. Uh, really, we uh, grew our uh, uh, social structure around some, uh, what was called central place theory, um, uh, a theory in geography, but we generally create centers around certain resources and then things grow up around them. And that's a fairly um, robust economic theory as well as a geographic theory. And it has applications to health services as we try and regionalize health services and provide them in centers uh, where people are. But still that isn't the picture of the United States. We have a, a, a mixed structure of, uh, of uh, urban, and uh, even adjacent to wilderness places. If you've been to one of the national parks, uh, you can find high density uh, populations right next to uh, wilderness areas demarcated by a, a boundary uh, for a large national park. Um, Wyoming being a, a good example, areas in California like that. Uh, so we have you know, very steep gradients. We have also, uh, mixtures of what would be uh, self-contained villages, not necessarily gated communities, but something that, uh, where there are strict uh, uh, rules of uh, entry and exit, uh, at least socially, into places. But what it is, we have a very mixed structure of geography that doesn't flow from 
urban down on from to rural down on to out into frontier. And we really don't understand much about this structure of uh, the way in which people actually settle in the United States and its effects on uh, health services, except at the very micro level when you ask people, where, where do you go for health care? What do you think are your opportunities for health care? And an individual's vision of their opportunities might be directional, and they also might miss things. They might not be able to recount things that they're unaware of in the, uh, the route in which they take to um, get to health care. This kind of uh, description of the geographic nature of uh, population is, is, is I think, uh, to me, compelling that we understand it more, but not necessarily uh, informative uh, to uh, what we're talking about right now. Let me turn to the uh, urban-rural uh, differences uh, to give you a, a sense of um, uh, one group's uh, concerns about the differences in health status and, and health opportunities. Um, rural places, non-metropolitan areas, are going to be on the right-hand side of this series of graphs. And this is a picture of, uh, and this is thanks to uh, Julie Schoenemann from the uh, NORC Walsh Center for Rural Health Analysis, uh, which shows a consistent uh, um, gradient uh, or a consistent difference in the number and proportion of people who report that they are in for, fair or poor health status uh, between rural and urban. That, cons that has been reported uh, uh, for quite some time in various studies. This one is from the National Health Interview Survey. So rural folks uh, certainly uh, feel worse off and they have felt worse off for quite some time. Um, give you a sense of uh, Similar data from the MEPS, 87 and 2004, there uh, continues to be a gradient. Rural folks feel they're in worse health. Uh, they have more chronic conditions. Uh, the blue and the uh, orange tones here are, indicate a uh, two separate series of surveys. Uh, but you can see that for chronic conditions of uh, any kind of chronic condition, hypertension, arthritis, little less so of a difference from diabetes um, and perhaps cardiovascular disease, but there are uh, differences in uh, the proportion of people who are urban, metro, MSA, uh, and non-metro or rural people and what they report uh, in terms of disease. Rural folks have more chronic disease. They have more health problems, uh, migraine, low back pain, neck pain, other limitations, uh, trouble hearing, serious psychological stress. Um, the non-MSA folks, the rural folks, report more of these. Um, the uh, Health U.S. did a series of special uh, report on urban and rural health in their chart book and, and summarized the situation as, uh, as particularly problematic in small counties uh, without a uh, city of 10,000 or more. And in general, there were higher rates of risk factors, uh, cigarette smoking, uh, obesity, especially among William, uh, women. Uh, death rates were much higher um, among children, young adults, and the old. Uh, death rates from COPD were much higher for men. Death rates from unintentional injuries in motor vehicle accidents, which is a particular problem in rural places because uh, folks are um, dealing with a lot more uh, machinery. Uh, they drive uh, pickup trucks at very high speeds and tend to uh, have firearms um, available and to use them um, more often. Uh, suicides, surprisingly, uh, rural uh, suicides are up quite a lot uh, in recent years, and um, the data show that that uh, ha uh, has persisted over time. Um, limitations of activity are higher for rural populations, and dental conditions are much higher, especially among the elderly in uh, rural places. Mortality rates, um, this is divided into two parts of the boxes on the top tell you the differences in, in definition of rural places. Uh, we've created a, I'm sorry, something happening. Uh, we've uh, changed the uh, definition from the Office of Management and Budget uh, over the past decade, and so we had to, uh, Julie uh, differentiated the uh, structure of these. But you can see on the left-hand side that there was a high metro uh, death rate, age-adjusted mortality rate, and then uh, it dropped into the uh, suburban areas, that uh, teal color, and then uh, grew as you uh, became more rural. As we move farther and farther uh, away from that definition, uh, well, not definition necessarily, but over time and redefine things, you find now that, that there is almost a regular step gradient. Uh, mortality rates have decreased in central cities, 
uh, that is county level, not center, uh, neighborhood centers of cities, but in the county structure of cities, uh, and increases uh, uh, monotonically uh, as you go to uh, more rural places. Um, this has been presented by uh, a number of folks, and it's fairly robust uh, result that mortality is much higher in rural places. Um, when you complicate this with uh, analysis of uh, um, uh, by race, you find there is uh, still a <coughs> racial differential um, that remains within uh, the rural urban gradient, uh, except uh, in some cases for uh, Hispanic populations. Rural Hispanics tend to be uh, slightly uh, healthier than their urban counterparts. Um, we can see this uh, n disappearing to a degree in chronic conditions, uh, in terms of reporting chronic conditions in the MEPS panel. But among whites and blacks, uh, the non-MSA, the rural folks, uh, remain um, uh, uh, reporting more chronic conditions. Uh, disparities in activity, uh, rural uh, populations uh, have much greater proportion with the total or serious limitation in their activity. Again, the Hispanic either paradox or conundrum uh, presents itself uh, in terms of work limitations, but in physical activity limitations, uh, it's a different story. It remains that all rural populations by race and ethnicity have a uh, disadvantage. Um, trying to uh, unravel the race and uh, ethnic uh, uh, components as well as other factors uh, comes up with this kind of uh, calculation. If you, uh, and this is one of many where we work through this, but if you have, say, the self-report of uh, poor health, poor fair health, the difference is uh, fairly broad. Uh, rural population, 17.4% reporting uh, fair or poor health. Urban, 9.9%. Difference is 7.5%. If we model this, uh, in adjusting for age, income, race, gender, um, the percentage difference reduces uh, much greatly, uh, reduces rather to a, a narrower gap. And uh, that percentage we can see by this just arithmetic calculation uh, would be that uh, the residual of rural urban differentials would be about 25% of this difference. This is for national sample data, um, which says that nationally there is this difference, and this is consistent among these other measures, but that much of it can be explained by the age, uh, gender, and uh, race and ethnicity make up. Let me switch over now to uh, discussions of neighborhoods, a different kind of geography. Um, I'm departing from the, the notion of rurality to something that's a specific geographic concept uh, about the neighborhoods, and I think this has been studied very uh, effectively by um, uh, Krieger and other folks who've looked at this. It's been, with the advent of GIS and, and the ability to look at neighborhood uh, structures, we are able to do a lot of this. Sitting uh, in the audience is Charles Croner, Chuck Croner, who, is, uh, who asked a question in the uh, first session. He's the editor of one of the world's best newsletters about GIS and its applications in public health, uh, which he does as a labor of love, but it's promoted by the uh, NCHS. And I would recommend anyone to uh, get to his newsletter. Uh, I guess it's GIS applications in public health, is it not, Chuck? And uh, it's an excellent, um, uh, really, review of the best work that uh, looks at uh, geography and, and health. The neighborhood, we've been able to do things like this picture uh, illustrates a, uh, what John Snow did in his map of the cholera outbreak of identifying individuals by their location. And you can do a lot of overlays and a lot of analysis. Um, there's a lot of promise here, but there are also problems. But the kinds of things that it does show us is that there are within, say, a county, in this case, Dallas County, um, and we're looking at this for, uh, for no particular reason, but HIV, AI, HIV AIDS incidence rate among teens within zip codes uh, within this county, you see that there are differentials here from the center city elements uh, out to the suburbs, and the intensity of the tone uh, gives a sense of the, um, uh, the di difference in, in proportions. You can see very high intense rates in the expected center city, which is uh, the poor uh, area, places where there are more minorities. And then you can see that decreasing as it goes out the suburbs, a classic uh, illustration of what we expect when we looked at micro-level analysis of uh, the effects of 
the context of living on uh, outcomes. This can be repeated in mortality from various types of uh, disease. It can be repeated in access to care to some degree. Uh, it can be repeated in terms of risk factors and, uh, say, environmental uh, insults for the population. But interesting as you look at this, if we talked about rural-urban gradients and we saw these differences of um, X percent less than uh, any kind of multiple, but uh, here you're talking about rate differences and I use the term rate ratio not as a technical epidemiologic term, but just as a term of convenience for this presentation. But you see rate ratios of 10 to 1. That is that the HIV incidence rate in the center is 10 times greater than it is in the suburbs. If you do an urban rural, rural comparison, the difference would not be as great. So what we're talking about are uh, differences in aggregation here. Uh, and that's one of the big issues when you're uh, analyzing geographic data is that it depends upon the level at which you look as to the, the, the uh, differences that you're going to find. Uh, that's something called the modifiable aerial unit problem uh, by geographers, MAU, um, or it can be considered a, a, a function of sampling uh, because there are small areas and that picture right there might actually uh, represent some degree of volatility in the rates because of small numbers in, one, in some places, and I'll show those uh, in a little later. However, most of these uh, analyses in cities are quite robust in showing the differences uh, in uh, communities in terms of uh, neighborhood differences in health. But again, I want to uh, spend a little more time with the macro scale and deal with regional geography. Now we, we know there are, uh, we recognize reasons in the United States, um, uh, we recognize there's the, the, the West Coast, the East Coast, the, the conurbation of the Boswash calendar, corridor, which is um, uh, a term used by a, um, um, a geographer of sorts, San Francisco to San Diego, um, but also we have rural regions, Appalachia is recognizable and understandable to folks, the Delta. Uh, the border. We, we understand that these are uh, regions that have a, a character to them. And, but we don't spend a lot of time looking at uh, differentials uh, related to regions. Um, Christopher Mur Murray last year in an online journal uh, produced a, uh, a little analysis called Eight Americas, uh, which looked at eight different typologies of American <coughs> population and looked at their health status differences. And it's quite compelling but it was not necessarily geographic in nature and I'm going to uh, stick with the, the spatial characteristics. This for example is a picture of infant mortality in the United States, a uh, five-year trend 99 to 2003. Um, and if you look at the intensity of the color, the darker the color, the higher the rate. And uh, you can begin to see that there are some patterns to this uh, and those are recognizable to anyone who says, well yes of course the South uh, and the Delta, uh, the Mississippi, Lower Mississippi Valley have uh, much higher rates. And uh, you do the calculation in your mind, okay, what is that? Oh, that's race, that's income, perhaps. But then you see their higher rates spread around uh, and uh, uh, perhaps some potential clusters, but uh, really you bring your eyes down to these areas uh, in the uh, southeast or the central south parts of the United States. The rate ratio of those at the, say, the 10th uh, to the 90th uh, uh, percentile of these is about 3 to 1. In other words, the rate ratio here is not as bad as it is in these central city to suburbs uh, characteristic rates, but it is not like the urban rural. It is not one of these, uh, um, you know, less than 1 ratios. This is a fairly robust difference, 3 to 1 difference uh, in infant mortality rates. If we look at low birth weight, as an indicator of uh, you know, cause for that, you find a, a much tighter uh, regionalization here uh, with the lower Mississippi Valley and the southeastern states showing a much more consistent structure. And then this problematic problem of low birth weight in uh, uh, just uh, east of the Rockies uh, in uh, Colorado uh, and uh, New Mexico and then on down into uh, Texas. Um, so you begin to see a little bit more regional structure to a risk factor, uh, not necessarily reflected in an outcome uh, of uh, mortality outcome, but one that represents a very focused opportunity for intervention 
regionally in a particular problem where low birth weight might be a little more tractable uh, than infant mortality. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, some degree of at least visual correlation, if not statistical. And the statistic statistical correlation we know is not great, but is uh, something that we can uh, really, we can work with in terms of uh, uh, focusing on this as a potential contributor to infant mortality or future health. We're finding that the weight of the baby, the weight of the mother are very predictive of later health status. Let's go on to uh, all-cause mortality. Again, we see these clusters, but we're getting to see um, the Appalachians show up, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, along with this uh, consistent problem or consistent disparity uh, in the southeast. Again, the rate ratio, the 10 to the 90th percentiles here, remember these are county-based data, um, is 3 to 1. Still much greater than an urban-rural differential, um, but not as much as a neighborhood differential. When we move to cancers, we see different pictures. Just a quick toggling here. And you begin to see that there are uh, um, some focused areas uh, that where the, uh, those areas in the southeast on toward the uh, Atlantic coast uh, tend to uh, improve a bit, and we find more concentration in the uh, lower Mississippi uh, region, the lower Mississippi River region, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, uh, up, up into uh, low, southern Missouri, and then the Appalachians showing up, and then a problem uh, perhaps uh, clustering up in Maine. This kind of uh, differential begins to widen when we see cancers. We're getting a four to one differential uh, in the uh, extreme deciles. And uh, I'm not taking the extremities, the 99th and first, I'm talking about in there where there's enough, there are uh, 50 to 60 county differences compared to 50 or 60 of the best off counties. Um, this is a, a situation where we, we might want to pay more attention. Now, the folks at uh, CDC spend a lot of time looking at this type of uh, factor, but we don't necessarily implement policies to deal with this. We've had an Appalachian regional, uh, an Appalachian leadership initiative in cancer. We've worked on this. We've had Delta work on this. But uh, the policy response has not necessarily been as robust as it ought to be. Ischemic heart disease, again, a slightly different pattern, but one that shows a good deal of uh, focus uh, and the rate ratio begins to widen, five to one, where we're talking about real differentials and disparities, not real, but more dramatic differentials and disparities with some interesting border phenomenon here. Uh, a good friend of mine, Paul Irwin, is a regional uh, health director in Tennessee and uh, really gets uh, not apoplectic but upset when I show this map because the Tennessee rates are much greater as one crosses the border. Is this a reporting artifact? It, it, we dug, nudged, and messed around in that, and we don't think it's that much of a reporting artifact. Uh, and we see some uh, disturbing clusters in some places. Uh, in Oklahoma, for example, uh, where I am, uh, I can see clusters uh, in eastern North Carolina. But again, we're talking about a disparity of five to one based on regional geography that can be where there's a focused, uh, the ability to focus policy. So if one was to say, what should Tennessee be doing? They should be focusing on ischemic heart disease. What should Oklahoma be doing? They should focus on ischemic heart disease because certainly something has been done in Arkansas, northern bits of Arkansas compared to Oklahoma. Something has been done in North Carolina and Alabama in relationship that that there must be something that can be amenable to policy in that. Now I'm going to use some um, uh, maps here to intensify this notion of re regional uh, disparities in mortality. These are provided by Linda Pickle and it's in the, uh, the Atlas of U.S. Mortality. It's one of the greatest applications of cartography, but it gives you a sense here we have stroke mortality for men and women uh, and we can find a little, we can unpack this a little bit more by race to look at these ratios. And the stroke mortality, the, the uh, brown areas, they have rate ratios of 3 to 1 for white men, 4 to 1 for white women. You can see again these regional <coughs> concentrations. These are in clusters of counties that uh, uh, Linda Pickle and her colleagues have developed or were developed and that they used to stabilize the rates. Um, interestingly enough, somebody did uh, some work uh, looking at uh, uh, congressional districts, uh, hoping that this would catch somebody's eye in terms of policy. Uh, the male rate, 
the ratio here, though, reduces. When you look at congressional districts, you have a, a, a diminution of the ratio, two to one. Uh, for men, uh, for women, it becomes even less of uh, uh, a difference. But you can still see some of the regionalization uh, in the areas that we've looked at. Uh, Linda Pickles and group uh, uh, did this stroke work, uh, looked at the black men. Now, we went back and we had white males before. Now you have black males. We have a geographic rate ratio of 10 to 1 with a racial rate ratio of 3 to 1. The geographical ratio, blacks by geography, much more dramatic ratio in terms of stroke mortality. Black women, a little bit less so. But we're talking about a geographic phenomenon combined with a race phenomenon to create very um, uh, you know, dramatic differences. Now, those differences up in the uh, uh, Upper West are due to small numbers, more likely. But we still have the clusters in the Southeast and the, the South Central. Um, smoothing these rates gives you, uh, um, this is stroke mortality by HSA. These are clusters of counties, white and black women. That's white females on the left by age getting older as you go down, black females by age uh, as you uh, go down. And you can see that there are uh, some changes in the structure, but a concentration of white females in the central south and in the southeast, uh, and black females as well. But uh, on the west coast, um, uh, the stroke of mortality increases dramatically for white females as they uh, get older. Now. Um, when we look at all-cause rate ratio for white males, a geographic rate ratio of 2 to 1, although we still have the same clustering. Place makes a difference, but place and race are making more difference. Again, white males. Regional rates, this is an um, uh, excellent uh, depiction of the differences, but you can see on the, the age-specific rates, this is all-cause white males. You can see the rates uh, vary by region. These, uh, the uh, box plots are by region. And you can see these dramatic differences. For black males, again, this is the, um, the 20th, highest 20th, lowest 20th percentile. And you can see, again, the clusters with uh, uh, problems out in the West for small numbers. But these regional rates for black males, the rate ratio has become much greater uh, than for the whites, 4 to 1. So we're looking at disparity intensified by geography. Now, is there an explanation for this? This is a, uh, a map of what is known as persistent poverty counties. It's data generated by the uh, USDA Economic Research Service. And these are places where poverty has been, the population in poverty has just been consistently higher. And this mirrors a lot of the uh, problems we see in health status. So the points made uh, by Professor Kaplan uh, are, you know, they're obvious. And, and in a spatial way, uh, this gives you a sense that there is something clearly happening uh, that has something to do with this uh, uh, phenomenon of relating uh, poverty to uh, disease, and that's we're understood quite well. But let's adjust for some of this geography because um, one of the things that what has been what has been done here is is that we've looked at county data, we've maybe clustered a few county data, and we've kept that uh, really fairly discreet in our analyses. Um, GIS and and the power of computers has given us ability to smooth these rates as we go out and smooth the, t the influence of both factors that affect uh, mortality as well as the uh, community structure because people commute quite uh, you know, great distances. They take advantage of the economic opportunities of 30, 40, 50, 100 miles away, uh, but in a, um, a, a pattern that's relatively predictable. Um, so uh, using something called geographically weighted regression is a fairly uh, new technique that uh, we have tried to look at mortality rates in the United States and their relationship to primary care. There was a question that came up earlier. Um, this follows some, this is stimulated by work by Barbara Starfield and Leigh Yushi, colleagues uh, uh, from Johns Hopkins, and I've worked with them on this. We're gonna, there'll be a little bit of a discussion of this in an upcoming article in Health Services Research. But in fact, in the blue says primary care means lower mortality. The black dots means the, the modeling is um, uh, robust and, and uh, uh, statistically significant. The red means that there is a negative effect um, on this. That is that there's higher mortality the greater the primary care. Well, this is the, um, the basic correlation. If, however, we control for correlates of uh, per capita income, high school education, <coughs> unemployment, uh, a 
percent elderly as marker for Medicare, um, African American proportion, percent of poverty, and urban population within we find in the county, we find that this effect reverses in much of the country, that we have a, a very a different uh, relationship between density of primary care practitioners and the uh, mortality structure. That it's very different in different places. Uh, upper Midwest, and some people, an osteopath would look at that and go, wow, that's the home of osteopathy. Somebody looked down in Florida and, and go, well, it's just um, old people being treated poorly. Uh, by uh, nursing homes or something like that. There's, there's a lot that this, this analysis says. But what it says is that the effect of, of interventions in primary care are different uh, in its relationship to mortality. That's a, uh, a, a stretch uh, explanation. But it also says there's something going on that is regional in nature in the relationship of, of context to mortality and probably context to the precursors of mortality. And uh, that's something that I want people to uh, ponder on a bit uh, because it, it tends to say, you know, primary care doesn't do uh, what it ought to be doing, but it, it might say something a little bit different. It means that we might need to look more specifically at the context we are working in and find out what is happening in the upper Midwest versus Florida uh, before we draw any conclusions or make any recommendations. So race, place is very important in health disparities. Race, income, education combined with place are powerful forces in explaining disparity. It isn't just poverty, it's where you are when you are poor. Um, the classification of the place is very important and that needs to be t more tightly tied to uh, a hierarchy of policy interventions. But unfortunately, play, policy is not very comfortable with place-based solutions to um, uh, disparity. Talking about regions is not very popular in Congress. The Appalachian Regional Commission, the Delta Regional Commission enjoy very little support, uh, but they might have been the most appropriate mechanisms for policy intervention than any that we have. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much to both of you for excellent presentations. Um, are there any questions? Um, Please wait for the microphone. I think what we'll do is we'll collect a few questions and uh, have the panelists respond. Um, hi, my name is Deborah Reed from the National Health Law Program, and my question is for Dr. Kaplan. Um, you've mentioned the concept of, um, make sure I get it straight here, compound dis disinterest. And you talked about it as a, uh, an explanation for the breakdown of those system protections. I was wondering if you could just tell us more about what are the factors that lead to compound disinterest. We can certainly talk about some of the factors such as lack of access to Medicaid, um, S-CHIP, and um, coverage packages that aren't as complete um, for those two social programs that, um, than anybody else. But I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the factors that lead to that disinterest. And what, what, sh what should we do about those? Okay, let's take a couple more. Jim Lowen, uh, sociologist in private practice. Um, I, for both panelists, isn't there data that show that uh, Hispanics are likely to leave the country when they near death, uh, especially, of course, those who are immigrants, and that that may be a factor behind some of the unusual um, statistics, like in the last uh, regional thing you showed, uh, the last speaker, and earlier uh, also in, in your statistics? Uh, and I wonder if you've adjusted uh, for that. Okay, and then uh, just pass it right up to a couple more people. Hi, I'm uh, Kristen Southers from American Public Health Association. Um, question for each panelist. Um, Dr. Kaplan, if you could, I appreciated your talk, especially because finding policy solutions to disparities is a great challenge, but one we need to take on quickly. And um, you did talk about taxes and transfers. Um, could you just go into that in a bit more detail, what kinds of policies you think would be appropriate? And um, 
for Dr. Ricketts. I'm specifically interested in what you, the very last thing you said, where you said it's not just poverty, it's where you are when you're poor. Um, is that relationship explained by access to resources? Um, probably not, but I'd like a little bit more specific on that too. Thank you. Okay, let's take one more in the back. Yeah, right there. I just want to make two very quick comments. Um, one, uh, thank you, Tom, for that very nice uh, plug for the, we have a newsletter at CDC if you're interested in uh, especially public health disparities <coughs> and the geography of it. Um, just contact me afterwards. I'll take your card or uh, email address and we'll get you plugged right into our CDC public health GIS users group. <coughs> thank you, Tom. Tom uh, ended on a very important note. He said that um, Congress or policymakers are really not comfortable with place-based uh, regional policy in terms of health. And I want to do a plug here, if I could, Tom, to back that up. And that is, when you uh, go back to your organizations and think about the data sets that you're developing, think about geocoding. And I cannot emphasize this enough. And that is, you want to get some kind of identifier, and this can be protected in confidential ways, but on your records, whenever you collect data, when, no matter what size your organization, and we're trying to push this very much at CDC, if you geocode, that is if you get an identifier for where that particular household or the respondent is located in your survey, and that converts to a latitude, longitude, think of the enormous power you are giving us to further <coughs> this discussion about place-based uh, disparity differentials because right now we're using a lot of spatial filters. In Tom's presentation, there is tremendous spatial filtering going on at the state and county health service area, uh, the atlas I worked on with Linda. Um, these are macro spatial filters. If we geocode, we have the power to relate characteristics, and I'm pushing this, census tract analysis. And when you get to the census tract level of health disparity, it really pops out in very profound ways. And the Congress, I think, and policymakers can identify with census tract analysis because everyone has a vested interest in neighborhood. The only way we can get there is if you have geocoding in your surveys. And we can always aggregate up if we have to. But you give us the enormous power, and this is the coming thing, I think, the coming geographic um, environment that we're going to see at some point where census tract geography will be a driving force in political health policy. And there are major efforts underway at this point to develop that kind of infrastructure. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Chuck. Uh, this geography is very, uh, I mean, is very important uh, in um, I think our perception of um, the, the condition of humanity and the condition of life. The question earlier was whether um, when places combine with poverty and whether uh, uh, how that place functioned in terms of, uh, say, access to services. The kind of the work I do in some places, uh, we interview and ask people about their uh, perceptions of their place and uh, their opportunities, and we find that there are um, the ge geographers prefer to talk about this as the landscape of health to some degree, landscape studies, and um, we find that the where a person lives has a great deal to do with what they see as their opportunities, um, and that that can can change dramatically as you move one or two blocks away. Uh, I just did a little field work in uh, New Orleans, and uh, uh, which uh, town I'm fairly intimately uh, familiar with, and and these this. The, the, these differences of a block or so are incredible in terms of uh, what people, especially young people, see as opportunity. Uh, and when it comes to health status and health uh, care or factors that have direct um, influence on health, um, these factors are quite dramatic. So when I talk about place and poverty being very powerful, it has a lot to do uh, not necessarily with the a place, a, a caregiving site being five blocks away. My daughter lives on Dryades Street, which is four blocks from St. Charles. Across the street from her is a burned out building, which is left from Katrina and three others that are still not rehabilitated. 
Four blocks away on the other side of St. Charles is the Turo Infirmary in an emergency room. The people who live next to her do not feel they can go there. That's a, a, a perception. They feel they have to go cross town to charity, if charity would ever reopen, but they still think that's there. That kind of perception of opportunity is the kind of structure that is embedded in place. Uh, it's really the, the uh, landscape that people perceive that is more important than the actual structure of the place. So I, I hope that comment answered some of the questions that you had. Okay, um, I, I guess I had four questions. Let me, let me just say that I actually disagree with what you said. I think the geography of opportunity is extraordinarily important in terms of its material uh, consequences. Certainly one can see perceptual differences, but the bottom line is can you find a job? Can you find a, find, find a place to uh, get healthy food? Uh, is there a safe place for your children to play? Uh, is the transportation good? Those are not matters of perception. Those are matters of uh, infrastructure and uh, development, which are, uh, again, driven by a number of forces, some of which are policy related. It's not to say that people don't have variations in perceptions, but I think the health impact uh, is much more closely tied to the nature of the environments in which people live. Uh, you live in a environment bereft of resources, you engage in a whole complex set of coping processes which, which over time downplay the level of disadvantage that you have. So I think this is a complicated territory. Now in terms of compound disinterest, um, <laughs> I use it for a number, I coined the term for a number of reasons, uh, both as a m metaphor playing on the notion of compound interest. And everybody knows what compound interest is, you put a dime away a day and you know suddenly you have six dollars. Um, uh, we know what that means. What we don't think about however is this compounding of disadvantage and how that occurs um, over, the, uh, over the life course which I think uh, there's now a substantial <laughs> amount of data about and also how it occurs at multiple levels not just medical care which is I think pretty much what the questionnaire was uh, pointing to it's certainly important but also at levels of uh, neighborhood policies, education, uh, work environments, a whole variety of things. So that's why I use that kind of made up uh, uh, Myra story. It's made up, but it's based on a lot of real stories. And as a way of showing how everywhere this girl turns and everything she looks at, we see this compounding of, of disadvantage and disinterest. Now, it turns out that there is some biology to it as well, and we're beginning to understand that there are cumulative uh, effects of disadvantage on uh, biology in a way that's related to many chronic diseases. So what leads to, to compound disinterest? Um, that's a complicated question. It's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I suppose we'd have to ask at its core is why uh, is the question why uh, is uh, it not a matter of great national shame that the U.S. has some of the highest po uh, poverty rates in the, in the developed world. Why doesn't this embarrass people, child poverty rates? Why don't the poor educational outcomes embarrass people? We have this mythology about how great we do, and it's sometimes not informed by, sometimes it's true, and sometimes it's not informed by the data at all. And I think we have to question, um, uh, there was a number of years ago during the Clinton administration, uh, an attempt to put out a major report on health disparities. Uh, the story was was just not good for politics at that point. That there are these massive health disparities that were where there are gaps that we're not closing, and the and the report was not not completed. Uh, as to the uh, issue of, of uh, migration on uh, ethnic differences in health, the so-called salmon effect, uh, the literature is mixed there. Um, very, very careful studies, for example, uh, where there aren't numerator and denominator problems that deal with uh, immigra migration, have shown very uh, have shown that this Hispanic um, paradox, we'll call it, so called paradox, because we have poor we have poor people who do better than we would expect from their level of poverty, uh, is not really the fact. Uh, it is for some outcomes and not for others. It may be true for birth outcomes, although the, dis the advantage seems to, is, uh, Paula would know better about this than I, the advantage seems to diminish with length of stay in the U.S. There's a kind of toxic 
uh, toxicity, uh, uh, apparently, in terms of birth outcomes. Um, but in terms of cardiovascular disease, the best studies of this show that the early reports from, from vital statistics data which showed, um, this is my understanding, I'm not an expert in this area, which showed uh, uh, much lower rates for Hispanics than one would expect have, are not borne out when you have carefully defined populations which are followed over time to establish the incidence of degree. So you're not losing people to this tremendous movement you have across the borders. Now what about policy taxes and transfers? That is, um, that's a, a, a topic of great interest to me. There isn't enough time to go into all the, uh, all the things that I might say, but let me just mention a few. Um, I, I've been one of the people who's tried to argue that, that, that uh, rising uh, income inequality in the U.S. does have health effects. It's a complicated story. I don't think it has to do with perceptions of inequality. I think it has to do with, with the distribution of material and uh, social resources uh, between areas and between groups of people and how as inequality, uh, income inequality increases as CEOs make more and more relative to line workers, how that translates into social goods and, and material goods that actually do um, uh, produce poor health or, or good health. Now, um, uh, there's an interesting comparison there between the U.S. and Canada. Um, the, the Canada has as large uh, wage inequality as the U.S., but the taxes and transfer uh, programs that Canada has uh, do enough redistribution so that the uh, income, in, income inequality after tax and transfers is much, much, much lower than the U.S. And interestingly enough, within Canada, there's no relationship between variations in income inequality between metropolitan areas and mortality, and there's a very strong relationship in the U.S. There are lots of things we can do. There's minimum wage and living wage laws. There's expanding things like the earned income tax credit. There's expanding um, uh, 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 various kinds of protections. Uh, there's uh, um, uh, all sorts of uh, things that have to do with, with how um, the collective economic goods of geographic areas are distributed across those geographic areas. And as I showed you in that picture of Cleveland, and it can be repeated over and over again, we have enormous differences in tax bases uh, between small areas, and that translates to health opportunity, differences in health opportunity. So I think there are lots of things. There's also things that, that are exa not exactly taxes and transfers, uh, but are extraordinarily important um, and also have a kind of geographic side also. Uh, we've just finished work which showed that um, that uh, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act in, in, in the mid-60s um, had an enormous impact on the economic and occupational status of African American women, not African American men, particularly in the South, and that that translated to health gains. And you can see, you can see slope differences occurring Right in 1960, right after 1964 and 65, so so, so changing the uh, changing economic opportunities, the barriers, the barriers of racism and discrimination, as well as job creation. There was an enormous creation of white collared of um, clerical jobs uh, that were actually associated with programs associated with the war on poverty with. Uh, the EO and a variety of other public agencies, which actually lifted enormous numbers of African American women um, out of uh, domestic servant jobs, out of being, being cleaning up, to having clerical jobs. Now, clerical jobs may not be the best in the world, but they pay better, they have benefits, and there's a whole variety of learning opportunities connected with them. Finally, in terms of place-based things, I, I, I was an early adopter of GIS techniques in, in the in the mid-1980s, we started publishing rates of diseases uh, and uh, expenditures for smoking-related diseases and other diseases in California with CDC um, uh, <coughs> support. And I found them uh, extraordinarily useful politically because, um, again, when people look at a map, uh, they immediately look where they live. And if they see that something is amiss there, there is a bit of a political imperative to, to find out why and to do something about it. It's not always successful. Uh, the elevated rates are not always elevated. There's a number of methodological issues as well, as which you're well aware of, as many, as many other issues. But I think place-based uh, uh, 
studies of place-based health disparities are extraordinarily important. Thank you. Okay, I think unfortunately we've gone over, um, we got off to a little late of a start, so I think we're going to take a break now for 10 minutes and we'll come back with the second panel. Uh, so thanks very much to our first presenters and to all your questions.
No, they, so yes, but I don't think I talked to Elizabeth and um, I actually did ask her where you were on the list. I should have. Um, I did ask her for my advice. Yeah, I have some specific advice. And she didn't think that the final system was a little bit. That's what um, yeah, well, that's, that's what Elizabeth told me. Is that there is stuff uh -huh. that needs to be Oh, I'm glad. And I'm actually very glad now. But a lot depends on how it does fit. So she thought that just before it fit. Yeah, I was. Should we just close this thing? Okay. Hi. I'm Mary Lee. Nice to meet you. So yes, so, so I think we can be um, optimistic. Thanks so much for coming and helping us out. I mean, you know, we're working and NSAL analyses will be a great program, but it's not the only mm -hmm. The prime program? I think I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, in my department, I'm actually only marginally involved in it, but um, perhaps yeah. Yeah. people might yeah. talk about yeah. yeah. it. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. That's where I started my career, and I medical career, anyhow, in a community health center. Yeah. Uh, thank you for introducing Yes. I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, right now I don't have anybody else. If you said no, I don't have anybody else. And even if, if the NSAL thing falls through, um, there are ways to have your work as a management uh, research system that still give you. I, I thought it was a
started talking about um, the United States and global health, because we're typically a global health program that we don't usually look at American issues so specifically. Um, but we thought that, uh, so we, I don't know, it just seemed like sort of a natural marriage of, uh, of interest to, to, um, to look at. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and so much of it is sort of implicitly linked with global health, even if we don't um, include charts of the U.S. versus, let's say, Africa or Eastern Europe or Western Europe or whatever, but it's, um, it, it, it's, all, it's all pretty, yeah, I'm sorry, these, 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 are, these microphones are, oh, um, no, we're going to go to David, you, and then, uh, actually, I think we should probably get started, but so we're going to, uh, there's three of, three of you, we're going to try to go for 15 minutes, -ish. Okay. 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 I think maybe when we first contacted you, we were just going to do two, so maybe that's the. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry about that. What I can cut. Okay.
I thought I'd tell you falling back there. I've been doing work. I have a book with those. These chairs have been. I'm going quickly over some because. Very interested in Arab American health. Right. And we are. Yeah, these uh, doing chairs are out of the city. So, yeah. Uh, 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 looking at the most out of the Arab American health in the state of America. It's great. No, I just. No, I have chronic back problems anyway, so. No, no, no. Oh, okay. I have it. Okay, if everyone could have a seat, I think we're going to try to start here in the next couple minutes. Okay, great. Um, I think we got off to a great start with the first panel, looking very forward to this second panel, focusing on disparities in ra race and ethnicity. Uh, we're going to start with David Williams, who will speak about race and ethnicity generally. Um, then we will move on to Paula Braverman, who will be, excuse me, Braverman, a very good friend named Paula Braverman, um, who will be looking at uh, race and ethnicity in birth outcomes and children. And then we'll be moving on to Mary Lou de Leon Science, who will be speaking about immigrants and Hispanic populations. Uh, so to begin with, David Williams. He's the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health and Professor of African and American, African and African American Studies and of Sociology at Harvard. His previous academic appointments were at the University of Michigan and Yale. His research has focused on trends and determinants of socioeconomic and racial disparities in health, the effects of racism on health, and the ways in which religious involvement can affect health. Um, he was named one of the top 10 most cited researchers in the social sciences between 1995 and 2005. And uh, David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, where is the wonderful microphone that George Kaplan used? Uh, let's see if we can oh, track it down. <laughs> no, I, I know, I know. I feel more comfortable standing also. Um, is there one floating around somewhere? Okay, we don't have much time, so I'm going to go fasten your seatbelts. We're going to really go quickly. Uh, highlighting some um, important issues uh, in terms of racial ethnic disparities in health. So first of all, um, there are large racial ethnic disparities in health. Um, the most pronounced pattern in national data is the excess ill health for African Americans compared to whites. Um, it cuts across, as George Kaplan was saying, for socioeconomic status. It's the same when you look at black-white differences in health. It cuts across a broad range of conditions. Um, and so th there's clearly no, no single factor or single underlying cause. I want to give you, a, a, using maps here, a, a visual picture of, 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 of one aspect of the disparities. The state of Mississippi has the highest heart disease rates in the United States for both blacks and whites. So here, uh, uh, by quintiles of, of heart disease mortality for white women in Mississippi, and here it is for African American women in Mississippi. And if you put the two distributions together, what emerges quite strikingly is that although in this one geographic context where both groups are doing worse, there's virtually no overlap between the two groups. So that the worst off white women are doing better than the best off African American women. It's just a, a striking example, even in a case where things are doing very badly, of the degree of inequalities in the United States. Um, Latinos also have higher rates of death for a, a number of health conditions. Uh, this is not. Um, uh, but their pattern is not as pronounced as it is um, uh, for African Americans. Um, just to comment on the, on the question that was asked, the contribution of uh, Hispanics leaving the United States and dying elsewhere is really very small to the overall um, difference. Um, it, it does occur, it is a part of the phenomenon, but it's not what's driving the pattern. Um, and there, there are bigger issues with the misclassification of, of Hispanics, um, both, both on the death certificate and also with the National Death Index that there's several, several studies have looked at uh, more carefully, and the point that Dr. Kaplan made is absolutely correct, although national data would show lower heart disease rates uh, for Latinos, um, as this say claims. Um, very careful studies has now been replicated across a number of cohorts show there's no difference or slightly higher Hispanic heart disease mortality rates. Um, second point I want to make, um, 
Issues linked to how racial ethnic data are measured, analyzed, and presented affect our knowledge of the existence and magnitude of these disparities in health. Um, here is um, uh, NCHS data on age-adjusted mortality rates uh, for the major racial groups in the United States. Here's the rate for whites, and the level for whites is one. You can see all other major racial ethnic populations have lower rates than that of whites, overall mort age-adjusted mortality, and the African-American rate is 30% higher. I want to talk a little bit about the limits of age adjustment. Um, it is a routine and widely used statistical procedure. It is a very appropriate and legitimate procedure to use, but I think we should be careful about what it does and what it means and when we use it and why we should use it. Most importantly, given the age structure of our racial ethnic populations uh, varies, it's a useful thing to do to say, well, what if they were all uh, 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 similar? Um, importantly, NCHS in its footnotes to all of its reports points out that age-adjusted rates are relative indices for comparison but are not actual measures of risk. But in fact, most of the public health community uses them as actual measures of risk and completely distorts the patterns, as I will show you in a second. Here is um, the same period at the year 2000, um, and we're looking at um, the racial gap in early life. Um, this is the rate for whites. And you can see that clearly African-Americans and American Indians, remember the 30% rate we looked at before, um, more than twice as high, um, almost twice as high, more than 1.5 times as high for African-Americans and American Indians, and even Latinos are equivalent or slightly higher in the early years. In the mid-years, again, you can see blacks quite more than twice as high, um, 1.6 times as high, and the American Indian um, elevation, elevated risk of mortality persist. Latinos then drop from the middle years, 35 to 44, lower than that of, of whites. And if we go to the older ages, you can see African Americans even through 65 to 74 higher, um, American Indians now equivalent, and the other groups are quite consistent. The point is, if we compare the age-specific uh, rates to the age-adjusted rates, a very different pattern emerges in contrast to an overall age-adjusted rate that was 30% higher than that of whites for blacks, African Americans have rates that are at least twice as high as those of whites through most of the life course, um, and at least 50% higher at, at the other point. So it's only beyond age 74 that the rate isn't. So the 30% the higher rate is, very, is a true distortion of the pattern that actually exists when you look at age-specific rates. And a similar pattern exists for American Indians, um, for Hispanics, we also get a much more complex story. It's only for the Asian Pacific Islander population that the story seems to be fairly consistent, regardless of how we looked at it. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it's just another example of what difference an age-adjusted standard makes in terms of looking at, at differences and trends over time. Um, for much of the last 50 years, we used a 1940 standard million as an age-adjusted stand standard for reporting national mortality rates. It has recently been changed to the projected year 2000 standard million. Um, and if I look at the absolute black-white differences in mortality from 1950 to the present using the old standard million, I would say that the absolute difference has been cut in about half, um, whereas there's been absolutely no change in the relative difference, 1.5 times higher in 1950, 1.5 times higher in 1998. If I use the new standard million, I would say in terms of the absolute difference, there's been actually virtually no decrease, 3.1 to 2.9, very small difference, and the relative difference is larger today than it was in 1950. My point is your actual conclusions of what the overall pattern and trend changes depending on which age adjustment standard is used. Um, this is the point I made about um, the accuracy of mortality data. Basically, they're pretty good for blacks and whites and not as good for the other populations. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a study that compared, by Sorley and colleagues, compared the race that individuals reported on the CPS while they were alive matched to the race recorded on the death certificate for these individuals. Most of the discrepancies are people who reported a different race being misclassified as white. You see, for whites, there's very small discrepancy. For African Americans, it's less than 2%. But for American Indians, it's quite large. Uh, for Asian Pacific Islanders, it's, it's also significant. And for Latinos, it's about 10%. However, regardless of which source of data you look at and which adjustment standard you look at, the point still emerges very clearly that the disparities persist 
um, over time. We have not made much progress in reducing them. So here is overall heart disease, mortality rates. I'm on slide 20 for those watching with us. Um, and you could see no disparity in 1950, but over time the rates have declined for both groups with um, a racial gap currently that didn't exist before. If you look at the number two killer in the United States, um, cancer death rates, um, a similar story. In 1950, African Americans had lower cancer death rates than whites did, and you can see the relatively stable with a slight increase uh, changes for whites over time and much more a steeper increase for African Americans. So a wider gap today than there was in 1950. Um, we don't have data over time for other groups um, uh, but one exception to that would be American Indians served by the Indian Health Service, about 60% of that population. And I'm given one example of that data. This is diabetes death rates, and you could see for whites fairly stable patterns over time, um, but fairly marked increases uh, for the American Indian population. Um, another example, life expectancy at birth, 1900 to, to 2000. You could see um, a very large gap in 1900. Remarkable progress in reducing that gap by 1950, but <coughs> since 1950, we haven't really done much to reduce the relative gap between blacks and whites in life expectancy. Um, excess deaths for the black population is another way of, of summarizing the overall mortality rates, and you could see the, the number of excess deaths um, each 1940, 50, 60, 70, 1998, 96,800, which is about 265. African Americans die prematurely every day. That's equivalent to a fully loaded jumbo jet taken off from Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport and crashing every day, and that happens 365 days of the year. That's the magnitude of the disparities in health that we're talking about. The point is we need to begin a, a discussion of racial ethnic disparities in health to, by acknowledging the fact that as a society we have failed, and it's not for want of trying. We've done a lot of things to improve social and economic circumstances in the United States and to improve access to health care um, and, and, and advances in medical research and technology. But nonetheless, we have made little progress in reducing um, racial disparities in health. Why are these disparities so persistent? What is driving them? Earlier in this country, we had a very simple answer that, that accounted for that, and that was it was clearly due to the differences in biology between the races. Uh, we now know that race is not primarily a, a biological category, as the statement from the American Anthropological Association says. Um, some persons have interpreted that statement to mean that, therefore, because race doesn't capture biology, we shouldn't continue to assess race. Uh, so entered the American Sociological Association with this statement to make the point that even though race is not a useful biological category, this is a very important social category. And the social aspects of race predict a broad range of outcomes. And until we get to the point where race no longer matters, we need to monitor our progress along these lines to see how well we are doing in reducing racial inequalities in health. Uh, just to give you an example of, of uh, an illustration of the fact, one of the largest um, black-white differences in chronic disease exists for high blood pressure. Uh, blacks have much higher rates of high blood pressure than whites. Uh, Richard Cooper and his colleagues um, decided to study blacks in West Africa. There are many researchers funded by NHLBI today who are pursuing the black gene that is responsible for the elevated rates of hypertension among blacks. And so they studied blacks in West Africa and blacks of West African origin in three Caribbean islands and in Maywood, Illinois, just outside Chicago. And what they found was that blacks in the United States had twice the rate of high blood pressure as blacks in Africa, and that whites in the, in the US have higher rates of high blood pressure than blacks in Africa, and that for blacks of West African origin, um, the levels of hypertension are not uniform, but it's really driven or related to the particular <coughs> social context within which they find themselves. Um, that's another example I was going to give, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it uh, as the misuse of race um, in, in, in even medical practice. Um, one of the important points is that uh, as research, nonetheless, on the human genome moves forward, um, and as we, we, we try to understand even our genetics, we really need to pay great attention to our social environment and to characterizing the social factors that may trigger underlying uh, genetic processes and vulnerabilities. Um, if we think of the patterns driving racial ethnic differences in health in the United States, I believe that there are two main patterns that exist. One is the 
health that is driven by processes linked to migration. Um, Hispanics and Asian Americans tend to have equivalent or better health status than whites if we look at overall mortality, the unadjusted national data. Uh, importantly, there are limitations to those data. I, I made the point earlier. But importantly, it's important to remember that these are the two groups that have high proportions of, of immigrants. About 70% of the Asian population in the United States are immigrants. Why that is important is that immigrants of all racial ethnic groups tend to do better in terms of health than their native-born counterparts. Looking at national data on infant mortality and overall adult mortality, white immigrants do better than whites born in the US, black immigrants do better than blacks born in the United States, Asian immigrants do better than Asians born in the US. It cuts across every racial ethnic group. So looking at a group that has a high proportion of immigrants, that alone tells us something important um, about what we might expect about the health profile. Importantly, with length of stay in the United States, the health advantage of Asian and Latino immigrants declines. We just published a paper showing the same thing is true for black Caribbean immigrants, the single most disadvantaged group in our data of blacks, African Americans, and Caribbean immigrants, a third generation Caribbean immigrants are the single most disadvantaged. Health worsens with length of stay in the United States, worsens dramatically by generational status. Um, I think as we look to the future, um, this is a point that's not well recognized, that Latinos and Asians differ markedly in their levels of human capital upon arrival in the United States. Um, and that the trajectories for these two groups are going to be very different. That, that over time, um, many Latino uh, groups are going to follow the pattern that looks much more similar to that of African Americans and American Indians and, and Asians may follow a, a slightly different trajectory. Um, this is a point that health outcomes worsens over time for immigrant groups. Um, but what I want to show you here, this is the latest data I could find from Ruben Ram, but, but looking at 1990 census data. Um, and this is the percentage of, of Asian immigrant groups that have a college degree or more. Uh, the white population was a 22% of adult whites, age 25 and old, have a college degree. And you can see the numbers are two to three times higher for many of the Asian immigrant groups. Importantly, there's also dramatic heterogeneity within the Asian groups. And so other data reveal that the Hmong, the Laotian, and the Cambodian, for example, do more poorly on socioeconomic status than African Americans or American Indians. So, so the, the point of the heterogeneity must be kept in mind. But the, the key point is the human capital that most immigrant, Asian immigrants bring is much higher. Remember the levels of Asian immigrants college graduation? Compare that to the levels for Mexican Americans, 3.5. And if you look for Mexicans born in the United States, it's 8.6, way below the national average, which means the next generation is not doing dramatically better. They're, they're still facing blocked social mobility. And that's why I think the trends over time for the two groups are going to be very different. You can see black immigrants, African immigrants, have really high levels of SES, more than twice the level of college completion than whites in the United States, for example, is true for African immigrants. Caribbean immigrants are not quite as high. But paying attention to the social capital that immigrants bring, I think, is important to look at and will affect their trajectories over time. I think we really need to understand what interventions, if any, we can do to reverse this downward trajectory that generally suggests um, that the American way of life is dangerous to your health, so that as immigrants stay in, in, in the U.S., their, their health deteriorates. And this is not just a Latino paradox. It cuts across uh, multiple uh, immigrant populations. Uh, socioeconomic status plays an important but complex role in racial ethnic differences in health. Um, George gave a wonderful um, talk about the centrality of socioeconomic status. Um, and the point that makes is the second trend in the data. So we've talked about immigration affecting those groups with large proportions of immigrants. The second big point to understand the health of the other groups is that groups that are affected by socioeconomic disadvantage and geographic and social marginalization tend to do more poorly in terms of health. And that's certainly true for African Americans, for American Indians, and for a group that we've not studied well, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, this new group also fits the pattern of, uh, of African Americans and American Indians. Um, I'm a sociologist. We know that virtually everything in life varies by socioeconomic status. So I just showed a pip, the slide here from ETS, the SAT scores by level of income. At every higher level of family income, SAT scores are higher. Um, and we know that to be true for a broad range of socioeconomic status. It talks about the power of socioeconomic status in determining outcomes. And for health, the similar pattern exists. Here is data from um, the National <coughs> Longitudinal Mortality Study, uh, pattern for white males, for white females, for black males, for black females, within each racial group, um, socioeconomic status um, 
is a powerful driver of health variations. I want to use another health outcome, uh, percentage of, of persons relating their health as fair or poor, and you could see the, here are the numbers for whites, blacks, and Hispanics, and you could see the black-white differences is eight percentage points, six percentage points for the Hispanic-white difference. If you look at those same data by socioeconomic status, there's something important that emerges here, and I'm showing it only for women in the interest of time, that's important for us to keep in mind because this pattern exists for multiple other groups. And that is, first of all, the variation within each race by socioeconomic status is bigger than the, the racial difference, the racial ethnic difference. And that's generally not recognized, and that's true for a broad range of outcomes. So this, the, the largest racial difference was eight percentage points. We're finding huge, much larger percentage points um, within each race by socioeconomic status. What's also evident here is that at every level of socioeconomic status, you can see African Americans doing more poorly compared to whites. And that's true for Hispanics at the higher levels as well. So that while the socioeconomic indicators drive part of the racial ethnic differences in health, it's not just socioeconomic status. There's something else about race that also drives these differences. Um, a, a good example of that is um, infant mortality by mother's education. Um, I'll cut to the chase here. What is evident here across groups is that as mother's education increases, infant outcomes improve. And that's the good news, the power of socioeconomic status. But what's also evident here is the elevated risk for African-American females, that African-American females with a college-educated education or more are doing more poorly in terms of birth outcomes than white women, Latino women, um, Asian women who are high school dropouts. So how on earth do we make sense of this very elevated burden that even the most advantaged group is doing worse than the most disadvantaged groups of other racial categories? Why does race still matter? Uh, three reasons. The indicators of SES are not equivalent across race. I'll give you some quick examples of that. Health is affected not only by current SES, the point George Kaplan made, but looking at the accumulation of adversity over the life course, college-educated African-American women were more likely to be poor, were more likely to experience social and economic adversity in childhood, and then really thinking about experiences of discrimination and institutional racism that might also play a role. Um, here is data about the non-equivalence of socioeconomic status uh, across racial ethnic groups. Here's data on the levels of wealth for whites, and just to translate it simply, I put for every dollar of wealth whites have, the wealth of African Americans and Latinos. So you could see for every dollar of wealth that whites have overall, blacks have nine cents and Latinos have 12 cents. Among the, these persons are equivalent in, in income, the lowest quintile of income, the poor in the United States. You can see for every dollar of wealth poor whites have, poor blacks have one penny and poor Latinos have two pennies. So these huge differences in wealth um, uh, dramatically um, make the point that poor minorities are poorer than poor whites. Mm -hmm. And uh, another illustration of that point comes from these data from the SIP survey that show that after adjustment for a broad range of socioeconomic and sociodemographic factors, blacks still had higher levels of economic hardships than whites. And this was impressive, the range of factors that were adjusted for when we still uh, saw those differences. Issue se uh, seven, as we think about this added burden of race, um, we really need to put the R word that we don't like to talk about use in polite company, racism, and its persistent effects on health. There are multiple ways in which research is pursuing that racism affects health. I don't have time to discuss them today. I want to give you a couple quick illustrations of them. One is there's growing research indicating that the experiences of discrimination um, adversely impact health. Um, Martin Luther King suggested that. It's clearly a hypothesis in his statement that it, it might, it, it, that discrimination could have profound psychological effects on African Americans. Uh, many of my undergraduate students believe that discrimination was something that used to happen in the United States. It's a thing of the past, was solved in the 60s with Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. That's why we celebrate MLK Day. Here is a study conducted in 2004 in Milwaukee. It's a classic audit study. What's important about it, it, it dramatically illustrated the persistence of, of um, discrimination in employment. All of the resumes were identical, but what this study found was that a, a white male with a criminal record had a better chance of getting a job than a black male whose record was clean. All of them had identical resumes. 
Um, this is a measure of discrimination that captures one aspect of it that I developed back in the mid-1990s. Um, it has been used in the SWAN study and has found that measured over five years, African-American women who report higher levels of everyday discrimination um, report um, more rapid development of subclinical carotid artery disease and as, as well as coronary artery calcification. So uh, good evidence that these experiences are having a toll on the physical health of these women. Uh, another recent study looking at Arab American women in the state of California and the impact of September 11th on birth outcomes didn't directly assess discrimination but looked at birth outcomes before September 11th and after September 11th and saw uh, worsening outcomes for Arab American women during that period of time. Uh, one aspect of racism that we don't talk about at all that is a central driving force um, is residential segregation. We recognize there's this complex web of causation driving the economic and social disadvantage <laughs> of African Americans, but residential segregation is in fact that driving force. Um, I am not unique in making this point. Myrtle made it back in 1944. The current commission made it in 68. John Sell argues that segregation was one of the most successful domestic policies of the 20th century in the United States. Um, Massey and Denton have also written about its importance. Um, segregation affects health, most importantly, by determining economic opportunities uh, as in terms of employment opportunities and educational outcomes. Um, I'm going to skip here. To make the point that um, Sampson and Wilson made looking across the 171 largest cities in the United States, that the worst urban context in which whites reside is better than the average context of black communities. Segregation for African Americans is also distinctive. Every immigrant population in the United States has experienced some degree of segregation, but no group in the history of this country has lived on the levels of segregation that currently characterize the African American population. David Cutler and colleagues, economists, <coughs> looking at the impact of segregation, concluded in a cohort of young African Americans that if you could eliminate segregation, you would completely eliminate black-white differences in income, education, unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhoods by two-thirds. However, we have a president who suggests that segregation is something we have put behind us. That's what President Bush said in 2003. In fact, if you look at data for the 2000 census, you can see that the levels of segregation in America's largest cities are only slightly lower than it was in South Africa on the legally mandated apartheid. One of the important take-home lessons from that is that even as we look to um, address the issues of health disparities, a fundamental component of that has to be improving residential circumstances. Um, we need an, an influx of, 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 of economic and social resources to improve the social, physical, and economic infrastructure of disadvantaged communities if we will have a serious impact in improving health. And I, I'm not through with my presentation, but I'm going to stop at this point to give enough time for the other presenters. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, David, for being so quick. Um, uh, for the, uh, those people who would like to either look back on some of the presentations that have been uh, already presented or to find what's missing from this presentation that David didn't get to, uh, the presentations are on our website um, along with where the archived wi uh, video will go once that is up and running in the next couple of days. Uh, we're going to move on now to um, Paula Braveman. Uh, she is Professor of Family and Community Medicine and Director of the Center on Social Disparities in Health at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, the UCSF is undertaking research on socioeconomic and racial ethnic inequalities in health with the aim of informing policies to reduce those disparities. Dr. Braveman is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and she has worked for over two decades on research on social inequalities in health and medical care and actively engaged in bringing attention to this field in the U.S. and abroad. As I said before, her presentation is going to be looking at disparities in infant health. And uh, Paula, please. Thank you, David. 
guess that's best for the webcast. <coughs> okay, well, um, hello. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and I want to congratulate the folks at the Woodrow Wilson Center for choosing this topic um, for this session. I'm going to be talking with you about racial disparities in infant health. Um, I'm going to be focusing on black-white differences in interest of time limitations. And I'll be using the term birth outcomes to refer to babies that are born too small, low birth weight, meaning less than 2,500 grams, or too early, premature, preterm babies born at less than 37 completed weeks of gestation. I'm going to talk with you about current knowledge of the likely causes of black-white disparities in birth outcomes why the differences are very likely to involve social factors, and in particular, why psychological stress could be very important and is biologically plausible, uh, and um, that particularly the cumulative lifetime effects of stress um, are a very likely candidate. You're getting some common threads through these, these presentations, I'd say. Uh, and lastly, um, some on policy implications, but like uh, David, I have to advise you to please fasten your seatbelt uh, because uh, need to go faster than was planned. Um, so compared with white babies, babies born to European American mothers or white, white mothers, babies born to African American or black mothers are around twice as likely to have low birth weight, to be born prematurely, to die in infancy. Um, the disparities are quite persistent. I'm just showing you here the trends in low birth weight, um, but the message would be pretty much the same looking at, uh, even though the absolute levels would be different, but the trends over time showing persistent disparities, not much progress at reducing the disparities would be the same also for preterm birth and for infant mortality. So this is a, a photo um, of a uh, prematurely born um, infant and I'm using it to, um, to try to get across just what the consequences are of babies being born too small or too early. Um, being low birth weight um, and or preterm are probably the best um, predictors of whether an infant will live to complete his or her first birthday. But it also is the best predictor among those babies that survive of very serious disability. Disability in the cognitive realm, emotional behavioral disability, physical disability, and now there has accumulated a, a fairly large body of evidence tying low birth weight or pre to and or pre, uh, preterm birth to um, higher rates of chronic disease, specifically diabetes and cardiovascular disease in adulthood. There's a tremendous burden on families. The economic costs are, uh, are huge. The um, Institute of Medicine is coming out with a, a book on preterm birth and estimated that the costs of preterm birth alone in the year 2005 were over $26 billion. So there are costs that are experienced in the realm of medical care, special education for the babies who are cognitively, behaviorally, uh, emotionally impaired um, if they survive social services for that same population um, of children who survived, and then the lost productivity, both of the families and the lost productivity because of the, the human potential not fulfilled for the, um, for the babies who die or, uh, or go on to live with very serious disabilities. So what do we know about the causes of low birth weight and preterm birth? Unfortunately, not enough. Um, uh, on that left-hand column on this slide, I've listed the known, widely established causes of preterm birth and or low birth weight, including tobacco, alcohol, drugs, nutrition, uh, a mother who is very short, um, and chronic disease. Now, in the right-hand column are suspected causes, and for each one of these, you'll find a camp of um, researchers who believe that they've got the answer, and this is going to do it. Unfortunately, we don't have um, a conclusive picture on any of these, but um, likely suspects have been infections, environmental toxins, physically demanding work. Uh, there's the camp who believes that it's going to be genetic, uh, and then others who say gene-environment interactions and then a growing um, body of literature saying that um, psychological stress, and particularly that experience cumulatively over a lifetime, is um, what will turn out to be the culprit. 
So it's one thing to look at the causes of low birth weight and preterm birth, and another thing to look at the causes of the disparities. They're not necessarily the same things. So the disparities that we see, the black-white disparities in birth outcomes, are actually not explained by the known causes of low birth weight or preterm birth. Um, in fact, uh, African American women smoke less uh, uh, than, than their white counterparts, and um, studies have been done showing that you still see the disparity after you control for those, those known uh, causes of adverse outcomes, adverse birth outcomes. So what about the likelihood that any of those suspects um, uh, in that, that right-hand column are going to be what's going to unlock the key? Well, people have been very excited about infections, uh, and um, for some time it's been well documented that there are higher rates of certain infections among African American women, but a causal hypothesis is very problematic because studies that have treated the infections have not consistently shown <coughs> Like Dr. Block, I'm <coughs> fighting off an upper respiratory infection today. Um, studies that have treated the infections have not consistently shown that to improve, uh, to improve the birth outcomes. Uh, environmental toxins, very plausible, particularly given likely differences in exposures, but there's been very, very little invested in research to look at environmental toxins as a potentially cause physically demanding work. Some studies have suggested that this could be it, not, not anything very convincing suggesting that that explains the disparity. In the area of genes, um, no one has yet isolated the low birth weight gene or the preterm birth gene. Both of these, and by the way, those two conditions are believed to be very separate conditions with different, with different um, etiologies. Both of those conditions, low birth weight and preterm birth, are um, the consequences of very complex cascades of factors and interactions. Um, so uh, genetic, uh, genetic problems at any point in these complex ca uh, cascades could conceivably uh, uh, result in, um, in disparities in the outcomes. I'm going to mention more about um, gene-environment interactions in a, in a couple of minutes. And the stress, the, the stress hypothesis, I think that there, um, there, is, there are a growing number of experts who think that it is, that this is a very, very promising hypothesis, that a large part, at least, of the black-white disparity in birth outcomes could uh, be explained by psychological stress experienced cumulatively over the course of a lifetime. So, you know, unfortunately, we have more questions than we have answers um, in this area, but I think that we can learn something from looking at the patterns. So here, um, here I've got, these are data from a, um, a California survey, a population-based maternal and infant health survey that my group conducts for the California Department of Health Services annually. Been doing that since 99 here. We've got the data grouped um, from 99 through 05. It's a stratified random sample of women selected from birth certificates, and it looks very representative of all births in California. Here, just for clarity, I'm just showing you what the rate ratio is, the black to white rate ratio <clears throat> of low birth weight at different income levels, and I've just used three three categories. So in the top row there, there's the poor, meaning those whose family incomes are at or below the poverty line. The middle row, the near poor, those one, with family incomes one to two times the poverty line, and those who don't have low income by those definitions. They're more than two times the poverty line. The black to white ratio, the black to white rate ratio among the poor is about 1.3. So a black woman, a poor black woman, has about a 1.3 times the risk of a poor white woman of delivering a low birth weight ratio, a, a low birth weight baby. Among the near poor women, that ratio goes to 1.6. And among women who are not low income, black women are around 2.5 times as likely to deliver a low birth weight baby. And I want to stress that at each 
income level, it is at, there is advantage that goes along with income among whites and among blacks. As the income goes up, the low birth weight rate goes down. Here I'm just looking at the relative disparity. And you can see that that relative disparity here seems to increase with rising income. This is a pattern that has been observed by others. Barbara Starfield published a study several years ago um, with national data and it was an incidental finding, um, but a similar take home message. I think it's very hard to explain this pattern with a genetic hypothesis. What about disparities by birthplace? Um, and David has talked about, um, about immigrant health, um, and I think I'll just be um, echoing, uh, in fact, in the area of birth outcomes a lot of what, what David was talking about um, with a whole range of, uh, of indicators. So we know that US-born African Americans have adverse birth outcomes, but the birth outcomes of black, African, and Afro-Caribbean immigrants have relatively good that are relatively good by comparison. So if genes were the basis, wouldn't you think that immigrants would do worse? Because at least in theory, they have the heavier dose of the uh, adverse outcome genes. Um, so what, you know, what is it? It's very, very hard to explain these nativity patterns by genes alone. A lot of people have thought, well, it's healthier behaviors. But some studies have been done, certainly studies among Latinas have shown that the, the advantage of the immigrants over the U.S. born among Latinas cannot be explained away by healthier behaviors. There's something, um, something going on here. This uh, nativity paradox has not been well studied among blacks. In fact, far fewer people are even aware that it exists than are aware of the Latina paradox. Um, I think healthy immigrant selection is, is a, um, a reasonable hypothesis that could be contributing to the better um, outcomes of all immigrant groups, that it's, a, that it's only for the hardy or the very sturdy generally will um, be able to emigrate. Um, but what about the stress hypothesis? Does this fit the patterns? Well, at first glance, I think you'd say, it, surely the process of immigration is very stressful. So it would be very difficult to explain the immigrant paradox um, by stress in general, but what about if there are different effects of different types of stress? What about the kind of stress that you experience as a challenge that you feel you can rise to meet versus the kind of stress that ex is experienced as a threat over which you have no control? What about the duration of the stress and what about its timing at critical periods in life, for example during childhood or during adolescence? And what about differences in the resources that buffer the effects of stress? Um, certainly not in the field of birth outcomes research, but broadly in the field of stress research. I think it's been well documented that optimism can buffer the adverse health effects of stress, and also that social support, although it may not always have an independent effect on health in itself, it can buffer the health damaging effects of, of stress. So how could stress influence birth weight and or prematurity? Um, it is biologically plausible in terms of what we now know about stress physiology. The physiological pathways have been documented not only in animals but also to a certain extent in humans. Um, beginning with psychological stress affecting the brain and going from the brain to different target organs in the body. And the main pathways thought to be involved were the sympathetic nervous system, which releases, um, uh, causing the release signals from the brain that cause the release of catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, neuroendocrine pathways connecting the brain with endocrine organs, um, principally uh, the adrenal glands which secrete cortisol. Uh, so epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol are the stress hormones. These stress hormones have been documented to trigger a whole range of adverse effects adverse physiological effects, and those effects, even though they're less well studied in relation to birth outcome, are very, very plausible. And these include effects on the, the third system, in addition to the sympathetic nervous system and neuro, neuroendocrine pathways, but also the immune system has been documented to be involved in um, uh, both in effects of stress and also in leading to premature labor and, um, in some cases, to poor fetal growth. So who has more stress? I'm going to present to you um, quickly 
um, results of a uh, study that my colleagues and I have, have done in California using data from that survey that I, that I mentioned, in which we looked at several major psychosocial stressors or hardships um, experienced during pregnancy. Unfortunately, we didn't have a chance to ask about hardships before pregnancy, so that's a big limitation. Looked at divorce or separation during pregnancy, whether one's partner, spouse, um, lost uh, his job, whether the respondent herself lost her job even though she wanted to go on working to um, distinguish that from women voluntarily uh, quitting work um, during pregnancy, financial difficulties measured in a couple of different ways, food insecurity measured using the standard USDA instrument, homelessness, domestic violence, uh, and whether either the woman herself or her partner or spouse were incarcerated during the pregnancy. So these are not minor, minor annoyances. These are very, very major stressors. We also looked at lack of social support, both lack of emotional support and lack of practical support. Um, we did this work, I'm going to be showing you the data from the work in California, but we did it with colleagues at CDC. Uh, the California survey is modeled to a large extent on a survey conducted by um, the CDC uh, in over 30 states. Um, we did the 17 other states had income data, so we included them. The patterns were similar. I'm only going to show you the California data. So here's the pattern, separated or divorced during pregnancy, just a huge difference between the likelihood for black woman or white woman partner losing his job during her pregnancy. We saw a similar pattern for the woman's own involuntary loss of employment, food insecurity during pregnancy, and basically for all of those major stressors that I um, showed you, that was the pattern, significantly higher levels among the black women than among white women. Here we just looked at, because there's a, um, some uh, experts on stress believe that it's not just it's not so much any particular stress, but the total number of hardships that you experience that may be driving health damages. So we looked at the total number of hardships, and you can just see there, um, uh, you can see that the total number much greater among blacks than whites. And you can also see that the percentage of women who experience multiple stressors, and particularly at the high end of the multiples, um, so much higher among the blacks than among the whites. Now, I'm not showing you data um, where we looked at this by income, um, but I can tell you that the income pattern followed patterns that you saw in, uh, in data that George presented to you on other health outcomes with a gradient. We looked at five different income groups, and what we saw that at each step, as income increased, the prevalence of the hardships and the number of hardships decreased. Um, so what we've seen is that, um, that the, the level of stress experienced by women during pregnancy is much higher among white women than among black women. We know that uh, low income is much more prevalent among blacks than, than, um, than among whites, and that's, that's true of, of uh, pregnant postpartum women as well of, as of the general population. Um, what is it that would explain the nativity paradox and what would explain why um, black women in the higher income group, the not poor income group, might have a higher relative risk of poor birth outcomes than their white counterparts? Um, so that what we've reasoned is that, I mean, we know that poverty from, from uh, certainly what other people have documented and then even from our own data on pregnant women, that poverty and low income is often very stressful. It's also true that higher income black women or black women of higher education, which is what Barbara Starfield had looked at, um, <clears throat> higher income black women are less likely than whites to have grown up in well-off households. And yet this is rarely, this is really rarely measured, what, what someone's socioeconomic circumstances were during childhood. The level of cumulative stress over the course of a lifetime, just even if you're just thinking about the stresses related to economic adversity, is going to be much greater among African Americans than among European Americans. Childhood stress or, and or chronic stress could lead to adverse birth outcomes, even if the pregnancy itself, the index 
pregnancy itself is relatively stress-free. Um, and that could happen via dysregulation of the neuroendocrine system. So, um, uh, for example, someone subjected to uh, chronic stress, high levels of stress in childhood could have their neuroendocrine regulatory system set so that they either hypersecrete cortisol in response to a relatively low level of stress or that they lose their stress reactivity, which then sets in motion other um, adverse physiological um, uh, phenomena. Um, what's another variable that's rarely, rarely measured in studies that claim to be looking at people who are equivalent um, socioeconomically because they measured current income or they measured cur current um, uh, uh, education? David showed that um, the, the uh, dramatic differences in the kinds of neighborhoods that blacks and whites live in. And we've looked at this dividing people, looking at poor blacks, near poor blacks, et cetera. And it, so at different levels of individual or household income, a black person of a given income level is much, much more likely than his or her white counterpart to be living under adverse socioeconomic circumstances in their neighborhood. And there are a number of ways that aren't too hard to visualize, and I think that, um, that have been talked about uh, that could make your neighborhood be bad for your health. And not just the obvious about physical danger, lack of safe places to exercise, um, air pollution, lead, substandard housing with dust and mold, access to healthy food, um, the, your role models, which could be particularly important for teenagers growing up in an environment in which the norm is substance abuse. Different social networks. If you're in a deprived neighborhood, there aren't as many people around who are in a position to give you a leg up when you're in need. Um, what about differences in stress in multiple dimensions? What about fear? What about anxiety? And what about the effects of despair? Um, what about racial discrimination as a source of chronic stress over the life course? And um, David talked some about this. Uh, a number of studies have linked experiences of racism, generally often using um, the uh, instrument that, that David has developed. Nancy Krieger has also developed measures of, of racism. Uh, and a number of studies have linked racism with adverse birth outcomes. Some have not, but more have than have not. Um, my colleagues and I are engaged in some work right now to try to develop measures that we would feel confident using in birth outcomes research because the answer isn't there definitively, and yet we think that this hypothesis needs to be studied about the role of experiences of racism as a contributor to the black-white disparity in birth outcomes. Um, and what we've done is, um, uh, is, uh, is some qualitative work, which is not within the realm of my own training. It's very quantitative, and most of my work has been that. But, um, but we have brought uh, people with the appropriate training um, into our group um, to do this. And just eliciting from black women of different socioeconomic levels what they say about experiences of racism. And what's very, very interesting is that it certainly confirms that women are still in you know, 2007 experiencing incidents of racial discrimination and unfair, unfair treatment that they would label as incidents. But probably the most striking thing to us has been how much of the experiences related to racism and st stressful experiences related to racism you wouldn't capture if you only asked about incidents. That there's this pervasive sense of anxiety and vigilance and it's about, am I about to be insulted am, or treated unfairly in another way? And for the women, women of reproductive age, very much it's probably, it, the emotions seem to be at least as strong if they're talking about their children. So fears about your child, what's going to happen to your child, what opportunities are open to them. Uh, it also seems to us that, um, that from the way the women have spoken that there's a lasting impact of childhood experiences and vicarious experiences. So we want to go on to develop measures based on those experiences and validate them. It would be very important to do that. 
So there's more questions than answers, unfortunately, about racial disparities in birth outcomes. Many hypotheses, the whole area has been inadequately studied. And in the face of that lack of adequate um, investigation, there's a very widespread assumption that the basis for the racial differences must be bad behaviors and genes, some combination of those two. And those are very convenient hypotheses to hold if you want to be taken off the hook from having to um, implement a policy, uh, a policy response. Um, how many studies that you've read have concluded that a racial difference must be genetic because the difference was still there after the researchers, quote, controlled for socioeconomic status, or SES. Many studies in birth outcomes research, um, I can tell you that, and certainly in other um, areas. Um, and I think this word of caution follows from a, a point I was trying to make, but also um, I, I think that David spoke very eloquently to this. Beware of studies claiming to have controlled for socioeconomic status. Studies rarely measure more than education or current income. At a, given education or, uh, at a given educational level or a given income level, there are enormous black-white differences in wealth, meaning accumulated assets, the quality and the rewards of education, neighborhood socioeconomic conditions, and childhood socioeconomic conditions. So that to claim that a given racial disparity is independent of SES, a claim made all over the place in the literature, even in some of the best journals, one would have to measure all of the relevant socioeconomic factors likely to be important in terms of what we do know about pathways. So income, educational quality, wealth, features of the occupation, occupational control particularly, and prestige, neighborhood characteristics, potentially one's perceptions of one's status and position, and all of these above factors measured throughout life, or at least at certain critical developmental periods in life. So obviously it is very highly unlikely. I don't know if, any, if anyone here has seen a study that controlled for all of those factors. Please, please give me the citation immediately. Um, so no study can control for socioeconomic status and be very um, in addressing a, an audience that I knew probably was more public policy than health, I particularly wanted to say to you, be very skeptical of studies concluding that an observed racial disparity must be genetic because the disparity was still present after they controlled for SES. So where the clues lead us? Um, I think we definitely need more biomedical research on environmental toxins, on infections, on gene environment interactions, um, also on working conditions. But the patterns that we see of black-white disparities in infant health across socioeconomic groups and by nativity suggest that social factors, potentially factors experienced across the life course, play very powerful roles. There is an important role for stress that's very, very plausible but that it's not conclusive yet. So what are the policy implications? I'd say that in the face of the, the big question marks that are there about the suspected causes of disparities, including stress, because admittedly that's not, it, you know, it's not conclusive, I think it certainly is warranted to recommend the undertaking of more intensive action to reduce the known adverse risk factors before and during pregnancy, the list that I showed you before, the tobacco, alcohol, drugs, chronic disease, even though these factors don't explain the disparity, concerted action to preferentially target um, uh, African American women and African American communities to try to diminish these would, would, would certainly help. Um, but what we should think about is what those are, the, those are the proximate causes, right? Those are the things that we measure close, closest to the outcome, the tobacco, the alcohol, the drugs, the chronic disease. But what about the causes of the causes? And we know enough to know that poverty and low education are the strongest links to alcohol, tobacco, drugs, uh, chronic disease, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that the case is there to say, let's have more intensive action, um, focusing on poverty and low education. Let's do it population-wide. 
um, but certainly making sure that African Americans benefit from that. And that we need to think not only in terms of sort of reducing the harmful exposures, but increasing the protective factors in households and in neighborhoods. But I also think in addition to just sort of pressing harder on the known risk factors, we also need, given these striking patterns um, and the very plausible hypotheses about the role of stress, that I think um, that it is warranted to call for bold experiments testing the effects of biologically plausible, promising interventions, including ones that reduce stress and increase social support. So here's one kind of um, intervention uh, to reduce stress. Um, and uh, you know, that, that, that is one. I think that may, that may exemplify the way we tend to do it um, right now. But I, my hope is that we could do just a little bit, little bit better um, than that. And um, I think that there's a very, um, there's a, a, a tremendous need for bold experiments intervening with social factors. But that's going to require bold policies because they're on a scale such that they can't be undertaken just by research agencies. They're social experiments that are what is needed. Because the causes certainly are, we know enough now to know the causes are multifactorial. You can't conduct the studies in a test tube or on a small scale. Uh, and you probably can't conduct randomized controlled trials of the, of the most likely um, factors. At the same time, scientific rigor is absolutely essential, and, and I think that we can be scientifically rigorous even when we can't do the studies in test tubes or with randomized controlled trials. It's true that al although, um, at, although many of us believe that um, psychological stress <coughs> is, is a very likely suspect, we have limited conclusive documentation of the health effects of socioeconomic adversity and the resultant psychological stress during pregnancy in affluent countries. There's plenty of data from developing countries to tell you what the impact is on birth outcomes of economic adversity during pregnancy. But I think that the body of evidence that we do have mm -hmm. on early childhood economic adversity and how that shapes educational opportunities which shape um, employment opportunities which then shape <coughs> health across the whole, uh, um, the whole life cycle. I think that we do know enough um, in, in that realm in order to recommend bold experiments targeting socioeconomic adversity in early childhood. And it seems to make sense, even if the conclusive data aren't there about what the yield is going to be with birth outcomes, it seems, it seems to make sense if you're trying to reduce the early childhood economic adversity to start while women are pregnant. So when do we know enough? This, I think all of this for me raises this very interesting question. When do we know enough to recommend policy change? And I think that the answer is that where the costs of the status quo are very high, as they are in this case, where we have just tremendously unequal chances at birth, based on skin color, where the costs are so high, I think it is, there is an imperative to act on the best available knowledge, not to throw standards of evidence out the door, but to act on the best available um, evidence and uh, the best available knowledge, since the word evidence seems to conjure up a, a very narrow notion. So I think that there are, there are very compelling economic uh, as well as ethical reasons to act. These come from bodies of literature that are way beyond um, the literature on birth outcomes, but I think that they, they really sh shed some light on what we ought to be doing to reduce black-white disparities in birth outcomes. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Paula. Uh, for our last presentation, uh, Mary Lou uh, de Leon Science is the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Cultural Affairs at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Uh, she's also the Adjunct Professor of Nursing and the Director of Milagros, the Migration and Health Program in the Center for Health Disparities. And finally, as a Robert Wood Johnson Nurse Executive Fellow. Um, Mary Lou? Thank you. Thank you. And it is certainly a, a, a great pleasure and honor for me to be here today especially as soon as I turn this on. <laughs>
And I realize that I have the distinguished honor of being between all of you and lunch. So um, I will also try to expedite. But I want to begin by saying I was very much looking forward to speaking uh, here today because of the platform it gives all of us uh, in terms of the health disparities uh, crisis that we continue to have. It's a crisis that began more than 20 years ago in my observations. And I'm going to start with a story and go through these. Um, well, here, we'll start here. Um, uh, start with a story that actually very much interested me in uh, starting my research trajectory with this population. I, as the, um, very early in my career, I was asked to do, um, consult with the Migrant Head Start uh, uh, program.